Okay, so now we've, now we've gone through the uh, few observations part of this, and now we'll go into the more specific uh, how to approach the author patient. Um, so let's start off with data gathering, how we built up our case, how we built up our pretest probability, okay? And I'm not going into details about how to communicate with the patients. I've done a lecture on that before, so please check that out. Um, um, it's called, I think it's called something about headaches, but it's it, it, main, it only uses headache as an example. So it's, it's mainly a communication video. So please check that out on my YouTube channel um, or, or on the block. So the precess probability is made up of our history and epidemiology um, of what we know of these kind of um, injuries. So in general, um, we need to know about whether this was a trauma or a non-traumatic event, so or a minor trauma. Um, that's really important. And then we will do our maples, um, or our medicine, allergies, previously in previous history, um, leisure, um, ethanol, and smoking. And for some of them. We have them here. So some medications that are important are like steroids and um, um, in other immunosuppressants, uh, especially if uh, if you think about the septic arthritis, they, they will increase the risk of septic arthritis. Um, and also if they are uh, in on steroids for a long time, then spontaneous fractures uh, on osteoporosis, early onset osteoporosis is a big thing. Then you have your <clears throat> diabetes type 2, which kind of does the same thing. It's, it, it's, it's high risk of infection and also bad healing, especially in foot and feet. If, if it's very progressed um, diabetes, then you should always think about um, having them in cast for a longer time um, because the healing is slower, especially if they also smoke, um, because that also um, delays the healing. So there are there are some things that to, to think about there. Then um, the orthopedic surgeons always know, wants to know about have they been operated on before. Um, and that's usually important to know whether, well, are there, how difficult was it? And so, like there some operational, uh, operation technical things. But also um, sometimes fractures might um, go in and affect other kind of uh, material that is sitting in the same bone. So if uh, if they have a fractured, if their fracture is just above the knee, then it's really important to know whether they have a hip fracture as well before or have hip hip material as well, because that might affect. Uh, you might also have need to have a picture of that material to know whether it's it's broken also or not. Okay. Um, then a, a thing that I just wanted to <laughs> dwell on here is cyprofloxacin. And cyprofloxacin or other flower, uh, I believe also other uh, fluorokinolones have this problem with um, tendon um, <laughs> tendons. Um, and I believe the risk of uh, uh, tendon injury and tendon inflammation it goes far longer than the usage of this. I think I, what I've heard, I think it's from Ken Milne. It's, it's, more, it's usually weeks to months after you stop using the cyprofloxacin, um, then you will have a higher risk of uh, tendinopathies and, uh, or, or, or tendon rupture, like the Achilles tendon rupture or biceps tendon rupture and so forth and so forth. So it's important to know whether they are, have, been, have been taking this. Um, <clears throat> but then, of course, one of the more important things might be mechanism. Mechanisms should be thought of as a data point. Um, it's not everything, and especially in big trauma, like in ATLS kind of trauma or ECC, uh, European trauma cause kind of trauma, it's not a big thing anymore uh, in the same way that, that it was earlier. Um, big injury, uh, like uh, big injuries um, in car crashes, for instance, rollover car crashes, and so on and so forth, doesn't wasn't necessarily the same thing as it was 30 or 40 years ago, when the cars were different. So, so mechanism uh, for this specific area might not be uh, that important as it was uh, earlier. But more importantly, <laughs> often patients don't know 
what kind of mechanism it was. Maybe their elderly in this is fall, LFL. Um, but there is this thing about elderly patients, though, that is, is really important to, to think about. If you are quite cognitively preserved, then if you fall, then usually you will fall on outstretched hands or you'll kind of reflexively uh, try, to, try to parry the fall in some way. But if you, if, you, if you don't have that strength or that reflexes or that cognitive ability anymore, then you'll just fall flat on your hip or on your face. The game, the same goes if you're if you're intoxicated with alcohol, and so so you, so so we see different injuries in alcoholics uh, or intoxicated patients and in the very frail elderly because they don't have <clears throat> the mental capacity to to actually um, to um, parry the fall. And I know some orthopedic surgeons use this kind of like um, they use this for knowing whether or not. Uh, to operate because if well if they can if, if like as an as a gauge as a data point I guess um, of their frailty um, we should assess like in general we should always for elderly patients assess their frailty uh, because that is really important for the orthopedic surgeon and, and whether they should do operative management or not um, so. Activities of daily living, which I haven't written here, is really, really important to, to know about as well. Really important. Are they up and walking? Can they put on their own clothes? What are the, what, what are their requirements of their daily life? Are they high functioning, like playing tennis and doing stuff? Then there then there might be place for an operation. If there's not, then maybe not. So these like that's really important. How do they use their body in everyday life? Okay, and then the mechanism, um, and I always think about it as this, like pre and ictal and post, like the, the same way you will think about a syncope or a potential epileptic seizure. So what happened before? And th here I think, like, what kind of age is the patient? Is it a good bone or a bad bone? Sorry, or is it a good bone or is it like an osteoporotic elderly bone? Um or is it the child? And they have they have different kind of even with the same mechanism they get different fractures, then and, and comorbidity like, um, and then you um, then you always have to think about the ictal. What um, what was the force involved? Was it was the fall from ten meters or one meter? What kind of forces were involved here? Were they biking 60 kilometers an hour or 20 kilometers an hour? So it's not as much a measure of how they fell, but but how what kind of forces were involved is important. And then I guess the mechanism, if they can explain it, how the force was applied. And I think and then like what is damaged, like, and then we just talked about like um, the elderly patient or the alcoholic that falls in a different way. And then after, what happened afterwards? Could they bear weight on their, like, could they walk or couldn't they? And then you'll do your physical exam. And it's important with this, uh, the physical exam that you kind of do it in the same way each time. And the, like generic myth method is inspection. And I usually do neurovasculars here, like neurovascular status here because before you touch the patient then you want to know is uh, have they preserved nerve activity have they preserved vascular um, activity and also because if you don't do it right away then you'll just miss it when you do palpa palpation and you will do and um, function and i'll go into detail but this is the uh, general rule and then you have special tests in the end um, then you always think about the scared of mnemonic, which we will do in a little while. That is like stuff that you don't want to miss, um, and, and stuff that is highly high risk of missing if the X ray is negative. So always think of these. Uh, we'll, we'll get to them. And then, and there's these general tips. Usually, examine one, examine, examine one joint above and one joint below where it hurts. This is mainly relevant to the, the joints or, or the areas where it's a circular kind of um, anatomy. That would be the uh, mainly the forearm and the um, lower leg, where you have kind of a circle between, we, we'll, we'll get to it, but if it breaks one, one place, then it'll break another place. And usually, even though it hurts maybe at the distal part, then they, they might have a, a proximal mesonova fracture uh, or a, a Galeazzi fracture. Uh, 
um, um, in another place, um, yeah, like a, a ring breaks only not only one place but two places, and that's why these ring places, these circular places, are uh, is important to examine the joint above and below. It might be really relevant in other places, but these are the, the places that I find them most re relevant. Um, it's also important to think about if if you cannot reproduce, this is really important actually, if you cannot reproduce the pain, like orthopedic surgery is so much like, can you reproduce the entire pain where, 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 where the patient says it hurts? Well, then 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 that that's the rule that that's how it should be but if you can't like in back pain well i can i, I can feel some of the pain but it, it, it like pain came on sudden they, they're feeling kind of bad they have a big pain in their back but you when you palpate their vertebrae and the muscles it doesn't hurt well then you should really think about other things like intra-abdominal catastrophes like abdominal aortic aneurysm is the kidney stone is the is it something else radiating to the to the to their to their back um if they have a pain in their upper extremity like their shoulder um do they uh, but you can't really reproduce it in any way um, then you really have to think about referred pain is it gallstone is it uh, acs um right so um and one of the classics in orthopedic surgery is children like the extremes of age children and uh, elderly people um, they can have pains in their um, when they present with pains in their hips sorry in pain in their knees then you should always think of hip pain and this is an area where you also should uh, examine a joint above or below but this is for another another reason it's not because missing a cold fractures in a um, in a circle area of the body it's it's more like um, um, uh, yeah, miss, don't miss the fracture above, <laughs> like the hip fracture um, that is radiating down to the, 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 the knee. Okay, and here were some of the examples. Then always examine the entire range of motion, yeah, and make the patient comfortable. Uh, I usually, if I'm examining the arm, I usually try to hold the arm in my arm. So that I can, so so the patient can relax. If I'm examining the the knee, then I'll try to like give them a cushion below the knee, so they can relax. Um, if the examination is difficult, then you can always try to either like drain the joint if it's a knee, or you can uh, inject some intra intra articular lidocaine, so that you can test the stability of the joint in the emergency department. Another tactic would just be to like follow it up. Where, and when the swelling is gone, but as we will go into, um, I've I've never seen it done that much in Denmark, but in here in Sweden it seems like um, at least at the course um, uh, and 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 in other uh, places I've seen it's kind of they're they're quite aggressive with just doing intraarticular um, lidocaine and then trying to um, see if you can like test it right away instead of following it up. Um, I'm not saying that one is better than the other, but I think it's an interesting test and an interesting way of doing things. Okay, so this is the Maddox. So let's go into details with this inspection, um, palpation and so on. So the inspection, always think of inspection like looking 360 degrees around the area of injury because there might be an open fracture, okay? So always look 360 degrees um, around. It might just be a small hole in, uh, in the skin. Look for um, tinting of the skin, whether it's it's like the, the skin is, is pale, and you should uh, you have to re uh, like you have to reduce it right away. Look for swelling and redness and and uh, obvious dislocations. Um, um, and look at look at how how are the patients sitting? <clears throat> Can they uh, are they holding their own arm like in, the, in an elbow injury or a shoulder injury like looks like a luxation or a dislocation um is it like is it like a hip fracture where it's uh, where the where the um the leg is shortened and externally rotated rotated um and look for how if the patient can walk how are they moving how how how, how are they compensating for their their injury are they compensating for an injury or is there a discrepancy between when you're examining them examining them and when they're moving so 
can it be distracted that's something we talk a lot about in neurology is there a distracting is there a huge discrepancy there can they be quote unquote um tricked um even though it's usually not they don't try to trick us it's some conscious and so uh, all right then we think about the neurovascular and the compartments after that i think so um the neurovascular will go through um and, but compartments try to palpate the compartments um uh, especially in the lower leg and lower arm um not just palpating the entire like just just randomly just try to try to memorize where the compartments are and then try to make a habit of actually palpating them because then you will know that the palp the, the compartments are soft and and non-tender that's a, a advice from arun sayal because then you'll know when there is a compartment syndrome more easily and then to the palpation part and this is maybe a bit of a tradition from Denmark versus Sweden, but in Denmark we usually say directly and indirectly um, palpation. And the, especially the indirectly, I would usually start with the indirectly because once you touch the joint or touch the area of where it hurts, then they might might have screwed up the indirectly as well. So usually start with indirectly. Indirectly would is what you in my in Sweden call the actual compression of the joint. <laughs> of the area that hurts so you will you'll you will try to if it's a if the if the if it's the upper arm that hurts and then we'll try to compress the upper uh, the, the humerus uh, from above and below and, and see if that hurts if that doesn't hurt then there's a lower risk of it, that being a fracture uh, and as i was taught in denmark then it's actually a very good test but i've never seen studies on this so i'm, I'm not sure that might be tradition and 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 uh, cultural um, differences between our countries and how we are taught stuff um, because they don't they don't take take this so seriously in in, in sweden as i'm as i'm aware of then you have your directly um their direct palpation and and it's important to try to like kind of like when you when you're doing your um abdominal uh i'm sure there's a lot of different opinions on this but uh, uh, at least how i was taught it's, it's important to try to uh, like when you're doing your abdominal injury uh, abdominal pain um examination try to start start to examine what is hurting the least and then move towards the the, the most painful stuff so if uh, so so you you want to uh, because if you're starting with the area where it hurts the most then you just make the entire area hypoalgesic hyperalgesic so everything will hurt after that and they might have um, they might uh, have fear avoidance pain like or ex pain uh, like pain from expectation of pain so uh, yeah um um try to and try to distract the patient when you're getting to the area where it hurts the most see if it's a distractible pain um because this this takes the edge of that kind of um the expectation of pain and uh, which might murky the waters <laughs> Okay. Um, and we shouldn't just examine it in a random matter. We should actually have some kind of mental picture, mental map of the anatomy. I'm not saying we should know the anatomy as the as the um, the surgeons can, but we should at least know what kind, almost kind of know what kind of bones we're examining. <laughs> uh, I know it's hard in the in the foot and in the wrist especially if you're not working with this for too long. But I think it's important to actually know what you're touching because if it really hurts at that point, then then it's it's a different thing than if it doesn't. And I think that's what some orthopedic surgeons allude to. That, well, if it doesn't hurt when I touch that bone that I know where it is, then it's probably not it. Okay. Um, and then, of course, remember one joint above, one joint below, especially in children and elderly patients and especially in certain areas. Um, and think I usually think about all the anatomical elements um, that that area consists of. Well, have I thought about bones? Yes. Have I thought about muscle, muscle and 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 um, ligaments? Yes. Have I thought about joints? Yes. All right. Um, have I thought about neurovascular? Yes. Then I've thought about everything that could be. Maybe there are also like um, uh, bursas. Um, but but um, but. Uh, when i thought about uh, like uh, everything <laughs> um and kind of be systematic about it and then 
stability or then we move into movement and part of the movement is stability and sometimes it's really uh, that's where you might want to do some kind of tranquilization in the area intra intra articular tranquilization maybe to kind of numb the area to test the ligaments in a decent way or uh, maybe um, show the patient that well if I take the pain away from the joint then you actually you can move it all right and that might encourage them to actually move in the next couple of days ju and just take their pain medication um, because otherwise they might be afraid oh I'm, I'm just going to destroy something if I if I if I don't move so that might be a trick actually to just both therapeutic and diagnostic to, to do some kind of tranquilization in the area to examine them decently but also to uh, make uh, them more uh, like rely on their own like empower the patient to to actually move um because they wouldn't be af then they won't be afraid um in the same way and then you then you should always do it passively and actively the movement so um passive movement usually at first and then active movement afterwards like passive movement making the like lifting the arm for the patient first and then doing the active movement afterwards and then you have the special tests. And our ensayal will usually say that the special tests have very little place in the emergency department. Special tests might be like for a rotator cuff injury, you you, you might do a open can, an empty can test. Um, for a um, ACL rupture in the knee, you might do a Lely's test or a Lachman's test. And these tests are usually restricted in the, or, or not that useful in the emergency department because everything hurts, everything is swelling. Um, and as I said, some tricks to, to actually make some of these, or do some of these, some of these tests might be using intra-articular lidocaine um, and draining swelling in knees, uh, as we'll come back to. But uh, depending on your local protocol and your local way of working, then it doesn't, you don't need to do these things always. You, you can just follow them up, but um, there might be a lot of benefit at actually doing it for sooner rather than later so the patient isn't mobilized unnecessarily, as I alluded to before. That's, that's really harmful for a lot of patients. So, so um, it depends. Uh, let's just leave it at that. Okay, so the, neuro, the neurovascular um, stuff. So um, I know this is something that I I, I love neurology, but uh, and emergency neurology. But but the um, the nerves of the hand, the peripheral nerves of the hands and legs, is something I always have to look so look up. So no matter what, always keep a book with you or a, a quick reference for these things um, because it's important. I find it even I who's interested in this, <laughs> I find it impossible to remember these these things uh, when I've been away from it for 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 a little while. I do have some rules of thumbs, um, pun intended, <laughs> that I want to share with you though, that might um, give you a, a broad picture of how to remember these nerves, um, peripheral nerves, and how to test for them. So, um, in the hands, the the easy way. Uh, this is from EM cases. The myotomes of the hand, um, like with the muscle, um, the muscle part of the nerve, uh, would usually be for the radial nerve, it would be a thumbs up. For the ulnar nerve, it would be a peace sign. For the median nerve, it would be this, the combination of the, um, the, the clenched fist and an OK sign. There's another way as well. If you This OK sign can also be put into all of them. So if you do this OK sign, if you ex if you dorsiflex the wrist like putting it that way, and then you will use the then you will test the radial nerve. And if you like really um, spread these fingers, then you will use the ulnar nerve. So sometimes this can be used just as one test as well. Uh, especially in children, it's hard to do all of the things. Then if they can do this one, then it's all right. Um, then you, and then you have the um, sensory parts, and then we'll come to that. All right, so myotomes, another way of thinking is like the median nerve is the um, is the British tea drinking nerve. And the British, I do a horrible English accent, but um, <laughs> the Brit, the, you say that the median nerve is British because it's, um, rem think about how you would pick up, a, like if you're really posh and you will pick up a, um, a tea, um, a cup of tea, then you'll like, uh, extend your wrist and then you uh, you'll do the okay sign uh, I just showed you and then you'll 
uh, pinch uh, with 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 uh, your 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 um, your thumb and your index finger on the uh, handle, and then you'll um, then you'll um, flex your elbow, and then you'll um, twist um, your uh, you'll you'll um, and pronate your your um, your your uh, on a forearm <laughs> uh, so, uh, to to drink the tea. So so the entire like doing a posh tea drinking um, maneuver is would would be the entire median nerve, and um, the other ones are like ulnar spreads. Radial is dorsiflexion of the uh, rest. The sensory. Um, depending whether you ask a hand surgeon or a normal surgeon, they'll they'll think that the, uh, the two-point discrimination test is more or less important. I'll just show it here, and um, I, 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 I haven't, I, I'm undecided on whether it's really important uh, or, or, or and because of the sensitivity and specificity of the test. Um, but um, the, nerve distri distri the sensory distribution of the hand is like this. And what is important is when you do the, your two-point discrimination, um, don't do it horizontally. Do it vertical, vertically. Um, at least do it vertically on the um, fourth finger, because um, then you're testing um, one nerve at a time and not two nerves, that which would be rubbish. Um, okay. So you put your and the way to do the two point discrimination is like um, test of, test of the the normal arm before uh, first. <laughs> Um, and 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 so the patient know what's what's up, and then you make them close their eyes, and then you you say, am I touching with one or two, one or two, and then you then you then you um, uh, increase uh, the distance between, and then you and you note how long the distance is when when it goes from well they couldn't feel two and they could uh, they couldn't discriminate between two and one. This is a really cumbersome and time consuming test usually, and that's why. I'm undecided on whether how important it is. If I have a patient with a definite like area, uh, injury, then I would maybe use it, but I will probably screen with the touch first. Okay, then you have your plexus. Plexus injuries, and in this, uh, this is important in um, a lot of injuries, also in the neck, um, but um, as a rule of thumb, it's like the middle finger is C7. And then you have two nerves, or, uh, two, or two, two, two ner nerve roots on the medial, the ulnar side, uh, also the radial, radial side, and then you have two on the um, radial, uh, uh, on the ulnar side. Sorry. So C7, and that means this must miss, and this must be then. Uh, uh, sorry, it might be. I believe this uh, this one is a bit wrong. Sorry, but it's like C7, C6, and and uh, five, and then there's like T1 and, and C8. Um, so it's like the, the two above, and then the two below, and then this one is the middle one. All right. So um, the reflexes uh, can be taught by the, like this. Um, the myotomes in general can, be, or the reflex uh, can be told like this. So it's like um, there's like this man, the, the upside down man is like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, and there's there, there's a rhyme that goes along with it as well. So S1 to tie my shoe. So the movement you do to tie your shoe, that's the Achilles um, reflex. Three, four, kicking the door. That's how you. That's when you extend your knee. And then that's that re patella reflex. Five, six is pick up sticks. C five, six. That would be your biceps your reflex. And then this, uh, seven, eight, close the gate. It's also break your radial, so that's why it's. Um... Okay. And the nerves of the legs. So you have your myotomes, as we just uh, talked about. Um. And just an important thing about foot drop is that the L5 and the perineal nerve are uh, can both be the reason for foot drop, but we need to do the inversion of the foot to know whether it's an L5 radiculopathy or a perineal injury, and that's important. Um, 
Um, also, the Maya terms like how you move, you can say. Uh, I was usually I I was usually taught that, you, well the L, five, if you if you uh, look at if if you think of um, the body, uh, um, um, like if you if you stand on your your heel uh, on your heels, then you look like an L. That's the L five. And if you stand on your toes, then you kind of look like an S. That's the S one. Dermatomes. I recently heard this this rule that was quite good. I think w with the the knee, the medial aspects of the knee to the lateral aspects, um, it can be thought of as like it's um, medial is L uh, L three, then it's L four on the patella, and then it's L five on the lateral aspects. Um, and then the little toe is S1. So when you test the dermatomes on the knee just uh, or the leg, just, just check the knee uh, medially, laterally, and on the patella. Then you have the L3 to L5, and then you have the S1, which would be the little toe. Check that, and then you've done. And there are all these kinds of more difficult... Um, and I, I think this would be enough. Uh, you, you will never be able to remember this, but if you pick something up, then I'll go look up these. <laughs> okay, going on to the vasculature. So there are so, uh, sorry, also nerves. Uh, so, so there are some high-risk areas for nerves and vascular uh, injury. And one it, one of them is shoulder injuries, like proximal humerus or um, shoulder dislocations. Axillary nerve um, and artery are in high risk of being cut off there. So it's really important to do. It, that's a high precess probability of this happening. I think in it's like it's like five to forty percent in axillary nerve in in shoulder dislocation anterior shoulder dislocations. So important to test test it. Uh, before the reduction, distal humerus and sub cyperchondral, uh, cyper, uh, uh, you have the radial nerve that uh, often heals quite well if it's injured there, and you have the brachial artery as well, especially in children. That's really important to check for uh, distal um, neurovascular um, if they have a cyperchondral. Um, then any cut in the hand, um, the hand uh, usually cuts in the hand. Are much deeper and much more severe than you think, um, and it's really important to examine it really closely, as we'll go, go we'll talk about later. Knee dislocations is a classic for popliteal artery um, problems, and if they have had a dislocation or uh, no matter whether whether it's reduced or not, um, they have to be admitted for uh, monitoring because. The test again. You have a high precess probability here, and the test being whatever, whether whether it's a CT angiogram or it's a um, it's an ABI or whatever it is, it's not good enough usually to actually rule it out. So that's why they have to, you, you need the time as a test, which uh, which would be the better test. And then you have proximal uh, proximal fibula. Um, yeah, where you you can have a perineal injury usually when you cast when you're putting a cast on the leg, it's really important to not touch the proximal fibula because you might get drop foot. All right, it's just about something about nerve healing um, versus operation. The reason why we repair the nerves is usually you, usually if they have nerve injury, that's not in, like that's not urgent. You don't have to call anyone right away during the night. It can wait until the morning. But if you have vascular injury or compartment syndrome, that's something that needs to be urgently handled right now. Okay. Um, but like nerve injuries, we repair them usually because it heals faster and it, it prevents the building of neuromas. Um, it's important to say that if it's in the hand, it will probably not be the same feeling completely as they used to. And there's a time frame as well. It's like there aren't seven days. That's the time that you have to like fix these. Usually, there uh, that's this is what the the, the the times that the hand surgeons gave us. I'm not sure that it's the same in the entire body, and nerves can can um, grow or will grow usually, and stuff like the radial nerve usually heals quite well in these kind of fractures. So I mean, it, it depends on the area. Um, so take it with a grain of salt. Um, and nerve damage damage in the hand beyond the um, Proximal interphalangeal joint. Um, um, it's the branching is too um, 
complex there you will not repair anything beyond that and yeah and in, in amputations of the finger well you don't you don't repair the finger you just if it is the finger then you just and unless it's a child but if it's a finger then you just let it go um because um and we'll get into that when it comes to hand surgery but um a rotten apple ruins the bud uh, the bunch like if you have a, a bad finger with none no movement then it'll ruin the, the the entire hand over time um uh, from uh, thinking about the homunculus uh how big the hands are in the homunculus and if it's just one finger is bad then you won't be able to move in the same way and s suddenly you'll unle unlearn the entire hands movements and then you'll just have a non-functional hand so that's why they're not attaching one finger um and this was this was a super control area where it's a high risk uh, right here okay okay so doing your vascular status is important and we all, already talked about feeling the compartments and um but there are other things that we should do as well so we should test the uh, you could test the crt um remember like the uh, kevlar refill time um compare with the other hand uh, it should be a warm hand as well you can check for pulses but we know how unreliable that is from the uh, the um, literature on um, at least at least if it's an emergency and <laughs> it's really bad from the literature on cpr um, you can use doppler um, it's not it doesn't rule out anything but it's important to notice whether uh, it's diminished like is it like kind of do a dic 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 dichotomized uh, version like is it good bad or or diminished um, because then you can compare it with the other side and a way of <laughs> the hand surgeons gave us this tip that well you can always prick the um the, the finger or uh, with a needle and see if it bleeds if it bleeds well then there is um, some at least um, um perfusion um, usually it should be quick and if it's you can like if it's quick or it's a slow that's all right but if it's a no, then there's no bleeding at all, then it's a pale hand. Okay, so you can like put that into three categories as well. Good, bad, and diminished. Then you can do an angiography, and that's what you do in, in, in maybe in proximal humerus. If you have some, if you have suspicion of these, if some of these tests are positive, then usually you will call your orthopedic surgeon or your vascular surgeon, and then usually you'll go on to an angiography. Um, but that's something usually usually you won't do that on your own and you have the delta and that i think is really important the time as a test like doing sequential uh, tests like this or the abi which you also do um, and because sometimes the angiography is not good enough and then of course with compartment syndrome is pain 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 and you you, you can do the abi uh, an a angle brachial index where you compare um in the leg um the perfusion with the um with the uh, arm and then you'll see whether or not um well, then you'll see if the uh, if the um the arm blood pressure divided by the uh, leg blood pressure gives you a um a quotient of of, of lower than 0 0.9 then it's a bad thing yeah okay there are some high risk things here and we talked about the, if, if you have a Costillo Anderson above two that, that uh, that's an open fracture scale we'll talk about it later but if you have a Costillo Anderson above two then that's the problem um uh, that, that that's a high risk of vascular injury um and but bear in mind a Costillo Anderson um if it, it will become above two if it's if it's um um major trauma or high high um high um high force um uh, trauma then it will automatically become a um a, uh, castillo anderson three if there's a hole in the skin and there's a if there's a broken bone even if they're just a minor um hole so okay proximal humors we talked about cyberconsole yeah knee dislocation and ankle dislocations of course uh, are also high risk of um a, a one that i haven't put on here is like obvious tinting of uh, the skin the only exception being clavicle uh, clavicles aren't um in high risk of injury in vascular injury um, um when it's 
as when it when it's just tending. Um, but tending of other areas, especially ankles, are something of a concern. Um, a uh, and one way of thinking about like one just one kind of fracture here is sub sub cyper contral uh, fractures in children. If you can't feel a pul if you can if you have a good CRT capillary refill time, but you don't have any pulses, then you can do the operation next day. If you have your capillary ref if you, if they don't have any capillary refill time and you cannot feel a pulse, then it's operation now. Then it's urgent. And if they have capillary refill time and pulse, then well, then there's maybe there might then there's probably no vascular injury. You can you can wait. So it's just like there's it, it's a good way to just think about the vascular status as bad, good, or somewhere in the middle. And if it's somewhere in the middle, then you probably need more tests or time as a test where you do delta tests, more tests over time, or you just call your orthopedic surgeon and, and discuss. And then the management of um, these problems. Well, you will do, if it's open bleeding, then you will do hemostasis, of course. If it's Gustavo Anderson open bleeding, then you'll do hemostasis. And then don't use a, um, a mask, you don't use a clamp, and not, not just any clamp, you, you, you use a vascular clamp if you have it, otherwise you'll do a tourniquet, a proximal to the injury, or you'll do direct pressure, and or you'll do direct pressure, and you'll do sutures around, uh, and close off, or you could do the straw, if you haven't, like, let's see if you haven't, if you have a totally segmented, uh, broken vascular tour, like, the proximal area is totally broken off from the distal area, and is a big vessel, and like you have what well you in effect have you, you have a distal uh, limb that is not going to survive if it if it keeps bleeding and you don't um, reproduce then you then there's been described that you could put a straw a small straw into um the uh, the injured vessel and and connect it to the uh, distal part and that might work until they actually they can actually operate on it. That, that might save the limb just a uh, MacGyver thing, but it, 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 it's worth uh, having in your pocket. Um, then you'll usually, after doing hemostasis, you'll do the CG angio, and then you'll do, um, then you'll call also plastic surgery or vascular surgery, depending on where you are and what kind of injury it is. We talked about the, the difficult to examine patients. Um, you can if they have a lot of pain then for knees only you can drain the fluid and we'll talk about how to do that then in the elbow you can do intraarticular lidocaine maybe 10 milliliters and then make them see that they can move as as i told talked about therapeutic for the patient and then they they they, they will take the pain medication and they'll see that they can actually do that they are stable in their inner fracture nerve blocks you can all you should utilize the um Finger blockade when doing uh, these uh, tests, especially if, if it hurts a lot and you want to test the flexors and extensors. Uh, hematoma block for reductions is really important. 10 to 20 mill milliliters of lidocaine for ankle luxations, for instance, or distal radius for luxations or, or um, distal radius fractures. And other, other areas might be, uh, for other areas, you, you can always use and try to use this um, as well. Shoulder reductions, maybe, uh, for instance. Um, and then if, if you want to reduce the pain from these injections, then you should reduce, and then you should do it really slowly. That's probably the most important thing to do it really slowly, slower than you think. And there is a theoretical benefit of buffering your lidocaine because it's really acid and the acid might be the thing that actually causing the pain. So, um, so doing, um, buffering it with a uh, one milliliter to nine milliliter um, sodium bicarbonate might do the trick, but it's usually this is the one that, that is more the, 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 the barrow trauma that is hurting. It's it's tensing and so it really, injecting slowly is better than doing it really fast. Okay, that was the um, how to assess the, like how to assess the pretest probability of the patient, and then we'll move, now we'll move on to the the test itself and. The test itself here is radiology, but the test could be anything. Uh, even um, questions is also a test. Um, so the next question would like, if I'm doing one question, then the, all the, everything that goes before that question would be my pre-test probability, and that, then the question I'm asking now is, is the test as well. So, 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 but but uh, we'll we'll just call this 
um, for sim sim simplicity, we'll call this uh, the um, the test would be radiology. Um, um, so for interpreting radiology, there are different. There's lots of algorithms and different. Uh, there are there are small tricks for each kind of area where you're taking a, an X-ray, and I, I won't go into all those details. But a generic approach that I think is really good and it's you can read on the, the original lecture, on the, the original here. Uh, Torquay uh, was the one who made this, I think, in 1995, this, this article. Um, the AABCs, which is used in ATLS and also the European Trauma Course, which I attended. And then um, check out this YouTube uh, video where, you, where they go through it in detail. So um, for any X-ray, this is, as, as, as I said, musculoskeletal and it's for it's just generic there are subtleties in each area that that i will not go into but i might uh, show you some some of them through this lecture but first of all you just ah what is uh, this the first day obvious abnormalities you'll just check for those see the first fracture so that you don't you're not distracted by by that pointing out okay it's there now we can go through systematically then accuracy and ad adequacy. So name and date, um, and what is left and right, um, is the central ray hitting the most important part of the area? Like, if you want a good description of an elbow, but you but you just, uh, but you might also think there is a wrist injury, then some people would just take a um, injury uh, an X-ray of the, uh, the the forearm, which would make the central the central ray like the the main ray of the x-ray go through the uh the middle of the of the uh, uh the uh, forearm which is not the area of interest the area of interest is suddenly in the peripheral of this central ray and that means that um the the picture quality in that area where the interest was is much worse so you, so so we should we should think of where where the main interest is and if we if there are two joints that are of interest then we have to take two pictures um it's it's it's, it's simple as that um and can all areas of interest be seen there's something called the rule of two that we'll go through here uh are there two views so is, an, is, there, is there an AP, an anterior, uh, anterior posterior view, and a later, lateral view? There must be at least two views. Usually we'll have more. We'll have an oblique view or some special views. We'll go into that, but usually it's those. Um, because if, if, if an injury is spotted in just one view, we, we should think of twice to call it. It has to be uh, seen in both views. Um, can we see uh, one one joint above and one joint uh, below? Um, do we have two limbs? Uh, that that's the um, especially in children, there is, it's hard to um, see whether um, uh, it's hard to know whether this is normal or this is pathological. And then you often take a picture of the the the, uh, the other limb to see what is normal for this patient. Um, two opinions that, that alludes to we have to have an, um, an, an x-ray operator doing like a radiologist doing the, the reading and then you have a second opinion like they're a senior to check the, uh, the radiologies and um, all the radiographs and, and as we all know like the day after a lot of these are described differently. And Arun Sayal comes out with a, with a, with a, with a number uh, 20% of all emergency x-rays are read um, um, or, 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 or misinterpreted at first uh, by the radiology department. And I think I, I cannot find any, any, any um, he, he quotes this number a lot of times, but there's no references uh, anywhere. And I haven't been able to find um, the reference uh, that he's talking about uh, or that anything talking about that number. But I think it's as a rule of thumb, we should just think we should, we should, when when we are um, seeing the patient, then we have a we cannot <laughs> we cannot play the same game as the radiologists. They are much better at interpreting the X-rays as we, than we are. But we have examined we have, we have examined the patient, and if we have written the uh, the referral to the radiology department as as well as we can, then they have kind of the same advantage as we have. Uh, we the, we we have described the examination for the, of the patient, so they know where to look. And where they should look closely 
but um, but we should always look at our own pictures. We should always look at our own X-rays because we are the ones who have the in hand details of the pretest probability and no word actually hurts. It's totally like <laughs> so so. And then two occasions. That's more like. Sometimes fractures have to be like time as a test. You have to immobilize it and follow it up uh, or do a CT if, if you don't want to immobilize it. And what you really, really need to know. Um, there are other things that, that, that goes into the adequacy and accuracy. But I think uh, like uh, for specific uh, x-rays, whether or not certain things can be seen. And, but um, um We'll not go into that. Then there's the uh, bone um, window. It's really important to look at it and uh, at a good bone win window. Window and sometimes you can have to you could look at, at it at, at a negative. Um, doing the negative can sometimes help you f find some of the fractures. Then you look for alignment, um, and that's whether or not the X-ray is rotated. And that's usually you can ch check the vertebrae to see if it's rotated um, um, or not. Um, then bones, then you check for bo check the bones, you check the cortex, follow the cortical line, uh, are there any breaks? A uh, break is by definition a fracture, uh, if you can see it, if you can verify that it's on two views. Um, <clears throat> are there any white lines overriding the bones? Uh, are they rounded or sharp? Rounded is usually old, sharp, or like if you have a small sesamoid bo bone or a small like whether whether or not this is an avulsion or not, if you're questioning that, if it's round, then it's more likely to be if it's round and it has smooth edges. Then it's uh, then it's more likely to be something that is um, old uh, or or not uh, not a fracture. But if it's sharp or like the sudden break in it, then it's then it's probably a fracture. Um, always visualize more than one view and. Always try to do the lateral view first. Uh, Arun Sayal usually talks about this, like, like the lateral view is the orthopedic view. Um, it's kind of like if I if I if I don't listen to the heart in a stroke patient, then I usually forget it, and that's why I do it first almost all the, all the time because then I can listen whether they have um, atrial fibrillation or not. And I guess the lateral view is something that is not it's really good to look for look for things. Um, there um, and and it's usually where you, you will find pathology, but we usually find, uh, but we usually use uh, very little time there, according to our NCL. So we should use the, the lateral view uh, first, and that is the main view for orthopedic surgery, um, as he usually says. So that was the cortex of the bone, like the, the peripheral. Then we should also look at the metal medullar part, and we have these things called trapecals. Trabecular lines sometimes going through some of the bones, uh, usually in, uh, in the um, in the femur, and the proximal femur. You can see very like the tra tra trabecules, and whether or not they are broken or not. Then we'll look for cartilage and joint. The cartilage is um, uh, is, is is not radio opaque, but uh, or or is not as radio opaque at least as other stuff. But but you you can see the joint space. Um, and and you can see the like how 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 big the joint space is. Is it narrowed narrowed or widened? And this is really important in the in the um, in the uh, for instance in the angle view in the Mason view. Then um, there's and then there's this magical uh, two millimeters of width uh, is usually um, a thing that goes again in. That comes again uh, in, in a lot of um, um, these uh, on the in these guidelines for when to operate. If there's too much widening and too much is usually often a bit more than two millimeters, then then it's too much. <laughs> and where it comes from, nobody nobody really knows. Sometimes it's evidence based. Sometimes it's just tradition. And then you look for soft tissue injury, and that's another pearl from the EM cases. Um, podcasts that you should try to look for soft tissue injury actually at first because the soft tissue injury will lead you to the fractures sometimes fractures are really hard to find by just do looking at the cortex but if there's a soft tissue injury for instance in the elbow then uh, like if there's a fat pad then there must be a fracture even though you might not be able to see the, the bone fracture so important to look for soft tissue um, 
always think about luxations and subluxations as well. And degeneration, not as important, but there is like, it's loss of joint space, it's osteophytes, these small things going out. Uh, if you have a joint, then, then, then the joint might be extended at the periphery through like small appendages, it almost looks like that's um, osteophytes. Subchondral sclerosis and cysts. <clears throat> and you can look for other things as well, like gas, swelling in foreign bodies. This is just a really rough thing. Like the, this is just a rough generic sketch, but it's good to go through in your mind to be systematic. And the more you practice, the, the better you will come at it. Um, <clears throat> so let's just delve into these, like these two, the as these asterisks I had in these two views, two sides, and so on. So two views. How many views is necessary? Well. And this is from EM cases, and there might be some traditional differences at your local hospital. But long bones, usually we need a frontal and a lateral. In joints, we usually need three views, like with an oblique, usually. In hands, wrists, and foot, you'll need a frontal and oblique and lateral as well. But you might need differences, different ones as well, depending on how, how like, like the wrist you need, I might need a special scaphoid. We'll get to the special ones in a little while. Then in angle, you'll need the frontal and anamortis, where you can see like the, the uh, joint space. And then you'll see in the knee, you'll have frontal and usually an oblique. Um, and in the lumbar spine, you'll usually have a frontal and lateral. And the two views, you ne always need to have two views at 90 degrees of each other with a central ray through the most important bit. That's like... <laughs> That's a good rule of thumb for a good X-ray. Okay, then the special views, and there are lots of special views, but some of the ones that we might encounter is the uh, a modified axillary view for posterior shoulder uh, dislocations. You have the wrist, where you have scaphoid view. You have the clenched fist, where you can, um, if you have a perilunate or scapholunate dislocation, which are hard to find. Um, where you might see this it's Terry Thomas sign, as we'll talk about. Then you have, sometimes you have a, have, um, a I think it's carpal tunnel view, I think it's called, uh, or hook of the hamate view. That's, and that's like special um, if you have a hamate fracture. Um, these are rare and usually a baseball injury where you have a bad hit into your wrist. All right, so then you have your knee special views and you have a skyline view of the patella. Sometimes that we, we use that. And for foot, you can have weight bearing, and weight bearing um, says something about whether uh, the fracture is stable or not, um, as well as being able to show you um, show you d extra details on diagnostics. So, if you have a weight bearing, in, if if you have a foot where you where you we're not quite sure whether or not there's a fracture or not, then if you do a weight bearing view, then then oftentimes, well, and you can see whether or not it's whether or not they can actually walk on it because well, if they can weight bear on it, then probably they can walk on it without it shifting. And then if, even if there is a fracture, then it's probably all right to make them walk. That's the logic of it, uh, some of the logic of it anyway. But Arun Sayal is is less confident in this weight bearing view because um, usually in the emergency department there is so much so much pain that they won't even be able to actually weight bear. Um, so, um, depends, um, for, uh, we might encounter it for Liz Frank. Uh, it's important to know that for Liz Franks, even a, even a weight bearing CT scan might not be sensitive enough to rule out a nuanced Liz Frank. So it's important to be respectful if the patient, uh, like uh, be respectful if you have a high precess probability for Liz Frank uh, injury, then you could do weight bearing views, but you shouldn't rely on them. Even if it's a CC scan, there are some casuistic evidence that it's not uh, good enough. Okay, then you have two joints. Um, and the reason why you want, a, as I alluded to before, if you want a joint above and a joint below, this is uh, uh, then it's usually um, it's especially important in the joints where um, there is this circular um, anatomy. This is a vanillekrans, a Danish kind of um, uh, cookie. And in Denmark, we usually say that these areas are like um, vanillekrans or these cookies. 
they can only they, they they cannot break just one place they can break they always break two in two positions at once so um what kind of areas are this in the barney well it's so it's the um i talked about this earlier it's the um it's the forearm and this lower leg and both the forearm and lower leg has this kind of circle here so they you have your ulnar and you have your radius but they are also uh, intercalated here and here so that makes a circle so if it breaks here like from a twisting everything but a just a direct hit where it just fractures right there and no nowhere else if it's, if it's like a dynamic movement where you have have to twist you or foosh like fall on an ostrich hand or or have some kind of trauma where you have to have have um, deflected the uh, deflected deflected your fall, and it's in, it's fractures only only one place. Then you should always look at at the second injury somewhere because it's really rare for them to break in just one place. Um, sometimes it might luxate, and that's well when you talk about Galizia and and Montecchia injuries. Um, all right. And in the lower leg, it's the same thing. There we have uh, the if you have medial malleolar pain, then you should always think about the proximal um, uh, injury of the fibula called a Masseneuf or a um, mid fibular injury called a Dupuytren's um, fracture. Okay, and then you have the third one that I know of is the pelvis. The pelvis always breaks in more than one place, almost always. Um, so if there's, a, if there's a fracture of the ring of the pelvic, the pelvic ring, then you should always, always try to look if, if there's another one. Okay. Um, then the thing about the taking an x-ray of the normal side, and I try to explain like this. Some areas you can definitely see that this is pathology and this is normal. And this is a normal variant, and there's very little overlap between these these two kind of um, um, presentations. And that's usually, especially in adults, but certain areas like the wrist or certain is like or really really small things like you like why like if there's a widening of some kind of joint space in the wrists like the pyrrhal lunate, like these these vary a lot and and they vary so much that the pathology and the normal variant like overlap a lot and this is often true for children as well where they have also is this an where, where you don't know if it's a new like a, a bone core an evolving bone or if it's an avulsion so, and and therefore in children especially you might um take an x-ray of the other side um, and there's pros and cons for this and um, I won't go into this because I haven't read that literature, but but in general, um, it seems like it's a matter of tradition mostly, and it's a good tool to have in your in your uh, toolbox to do this. But there are different some cons, and sometimes you'll just get more confused um, than actually <laughs> because how can can you make the other picture of the of the left elbow may look exactly like the right elbow, and can you there, there are minor differences that might make the potential benefits like wash out um, because of uh, impurities or um, even bigger variance between left and right or yeah so so it's not a perfect science this but it's it's something that's talked about okay then two occasions and this is a like the, the, the where where you might want to do an follow-up x-ray with the patient and if you don't have time or if it's too far out like three or four weeks before you can do that and you have to immobilize the entire time then well then it's probably better sometimes to, uh, to do a ct scan to get it done right away or if the injury is really not like don't miss this injury like a list ranks injury then do and see do a ct scan um and when do you actually need to do ct scans and mris well in EM cases, they find that in their newer podcasts, they find that they do CT scans more and more, and maybe it isn't as necessary. In the courses that I attended, it seems like, especially in the foot and the wrist um, and, and the elbow, there might be a need for CT scans oftentimes. Um, what I, from the EM cases, they usually say like this, like, 
calcaneal fractures might, but not necessarily ED, but there are certain fractures here that you don't want to miss. Also talus fractures. So that's, that's kind of goes, that's, that's kind of the same as I've heard of from our courses. The list Frank, and we talked about weight bearing is not necessarily hundred percent sensitive, but it's quite a good test anyway. So it depends on your pretest probability. Your tibial plateau fractures, these are really hard sometimes, and I'll show you a way of finding them, but it's really hard sometimes to find these. So this might need a CT if you have a high precess probability. Occult hip fractures, sometimes it's really hard to see these as well, and sternoclavicular misalignment, they will always need a CT, but that's because you need the CT of the thorax to actually assess whether there's been vascular injury, and this would be an angiogram. Uh, to see whether there's a vascular injury if you have a st sternoclavicular misalignment uh, or a, a dislocation. Ultrasound, um, well, it's controversial as I talked to, uh, in, talked to you about in the first part of this lecture. Um, ultrasound is not um, a really good thing in musculoskeletal, at least not as good as it is, as it is in medicine. And uh, as I ph philosophize in my own way, it might be because the medical um, exam in medicine is quite dull, quite a dull instrument with a low sensitivity and specificity and a high, uh, like a high interrate reliability, uh, like a high interrate re reliability. People cannot agree, and there's a lot of expertise that goes into it. Um, and therefore the uh, ultrasound is much more useful here but in orthopedics um, it's much more one-to-one -one. it's much more if i examine this anatomically correctly then then it's then well the the exam is much more valuable here and therefore the room for focus uh, and the need for focus there's not not such a gap to fill there and uh, usually achilles seen ten, uh, achilles tendon ruptures are, are are usually an example where it doesn't probably matter um yeah that's what i'm going to say about that ultrasound is controversial is the take a home uh, take home in in musculoskeletal uh orthopedic injuries anyway okay so how do we describe the x-ray so let's say we're doing the referral to orthopedic surgery we'll of course do an s-bar history and uh, we'll talk about the clinical findings there and you'll talk about the radiological findings and then maybe talk about other investigations but how are we going to describe the radiological findings well um when we're describing a fracture we need to like know what the definition of it is and that is any disruption of or break you know in continuity of the bone and cortex um and then, and then there can be soft tissue injuries um Sometimes there's only soft tissue injuries, and that's and it's occult fractures, for instance, in elbows. Um, but then you have to describe the fracture, and it can be open or closed. That's something you see clinically. Use a 360 degrees t uh, inspection of the area. Um, then the location, and you need to locate where, like the bone name and the site. Well, this is a and, the, and whether it's the mid, distal, or proximal. So you'll you'll say well. Um, this is a like a this is a distal uh, right-sided um, humerus fracture, um, um, and then you might want to talk about whether it's an epi or diaphysis or metaphysis or physis in pediatrics especially or an apophysis, um, and we'll talk about how to how to find the metaphysis, but in general, um, the metaphysis is defined as like if you take the it's it, like a rule of thumb is take the length here that's x and then you do a a, um, a, re, a, a um, rectangle uh, or sorry a cube you you'll do like like x uh, x this way then x up and that's the metaphysis uh, area <laughs> um here it would be x here and then and then the same distance up, that's here, and then there, there. So that's the metaphysis. And as we'll talk about, the metaphysis in children is magical. It will be able to break and it will heal crazy angles um, over time. And that's why you usually you don't have to operate on children. Um, the physis is the area between the, ep the epiphysis and the physis. Oh, sorry, the epiphysis and the metaphysis. 
and the DFIs is in, 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 in children and adults is the same. It's very unmagical. <laughs> if it breaks, it breaks, and it, it, there's little growth potential or no growth potential there, so you need to uh, fix it. All right. And just in other bones, it's the ephysis, the metaphysis, the growth plate, the physis, and then the epiphysis, and you have sesamoid bones. Um, and sometimes you have these apophysis in certain bones. Okay. So then that's the location. Then you have to describe the type of fracture. Is it the complete or incomplete? And what kind of pattern? So complete meaning all the way through, or incomplete meaning not all the way through. These are usually children fractures. So you have, and then you can, and then you can, just for completeness, talk about like simple fractures. That's only one fracture line. That would be a transverse fracture or an oblique fracture or a spiral fracture where it's uh, not as clean as the least less shard up. Then you have two fracture lines where you have a fracture line here and here, meaning that there are three pieces. Um, and that was, this, this would be what you call a segmental fracture. And then you have your comminuted where there's more than two fragments and more than two fracture lines. And these are these, okay? Then you have your incomplete. These are your buckle or torus fractures, or um, where where the where the and we'll talk about like the periosteus is really strong here. That's why um, that that this doesn't break, but the but the but the inside breaks. Um, and you have your green stick where one side but not the other breaks. Okay, so that's the type of fracture. And then you have the, the displacement. That's really important. That's where um, usually management is. Um, decided um, whether or not we should operate or not. So displacement, we, we talk about displacement, um, angulation, shortening, and rotation. And there's this called uh, Lara, that you can, uh, this uh, mnemonic called Lara, where you can describe it. So Lara length, is it shortened? If it's shortened, like overlaying each other, or it can be impacted where it goes into each other. Then the apposition, which sometimes is also called confusingly dislocated, dislocation amount. So if um, a bone is translated up or down, then you can describe it as percentage of um, cortical alignment. So um, here is this this gap is maybe 25% to 50%. This is 100% um, um, apposis uh, dislocated. Uh, and you'll describe it laterally or medially, medially, approximately or distally, depending on location. And then rotation. Usually, rotation is hard to describe radio radiologically, as I uh, as I've been informed. Um, and it's important to describe it also clinically, at least. And then angulation. And angulation is um, if you take a line through the proximal segment and the distal segment. Then the, um, the the line between these, the, the angle between these, uh, are the angulation. Then you, this one is both 100% um, trans um, translated or dislocated and also angulated. Sometimes you'll call all of this, all of this, just dislocated. It's a dislocated limb. Um, yeah. And then you have the conventions here. You can pause to 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 read these. Um, so let's do an example here. Here we have a fracture of the proximal uh, humerus, it seems. So um, let's go through, uh, first of all, our how do we describe the radiology. So, ah, it's obvious there's this thing. Okay, accuracy, we don't have a name, we don't have a date. We, we know it's probably the right, the right side, but there's no marking of it, but it seems like it's the right side. Does the central ray go through the um, the important area? Yes, it does. Is the viewing uh, are we viewing on the good screen? No, we're viewing on a PowerPoint here. <laughs> we could um, make this better and zoom in and so on. Is the alignment good? Well, it seems like the alignment is good. It doesn't seem rotated on the um, on the vertebrae. Um, so now we go through all the bones. So let's go through. And the humerus, and I, I can't zoom in here, so sorry, but we that would be the best part, best to do. So 
we're going through and it seems like yeah that's that's obvious and then you have here and it doesn't really so you just go along the lines of all of these i'll check is this is this in the same uh, as the um, acromion it seems like it is the scapula this is all right yes the ribs and and so on and so forth um and then we'll go on to uh, check the cartilage and uh, are there any distances uh, uh, narrowed it's not as important here as it is in our other areas so we'll just skip that and then we'll check for soft tissue injuries uh, there might see might be a little bit of a shattering here uh, to make sense because you see where the fracture is and um is there luxation well we might need a another view to to see that as well but it doesn't seem like it so we think okay ah oh, it's it, there's a humeral fracture rule two the, the central is okay there's no rotation there is a break we saw the break and the joint space looks okay okay there's a bit of shattering as we talked about it's it seems like it is in joint um then we have to describe the break. And that's where we use this um, this uh, thing here um, that we talked about. Is it open or closed? We don't know, but it doesn't. It's it's a clinical thing, but open fractures usually go out or will sometimes go all the way out, and you can see like obviously this must be open um, when there is tending, but uh, you need to look clinically. So, but we'll um, so we don't know. But it seems like it's closed on on like how it looks. Location well, it's the humerus. It's a proximal humerus fracture, and it's the shaft or the diaphysis because the metaphysis would be that area, that area, like that X, and that's X, and then yeah. So it's 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 distal to the uh, metaphysis. Then the tiber fracture. Well, it's a um, it's transverse fracture, it's a symbol fracture, it's a complete fracture. So it's a complete transverse fracture, it seems. Um, and it's not, it doesn't seem like it's comminuted. It doesn't, it, it, there's only one fracture line, from what I can see. And then whether or not it's displaced. And here, well, this is one of these. Um, so L, is it shortened? Um, yes, it is shortened. Um, is it. Um, uh, displaced or uh, ap <laughs> translated or apposized, ap appositioned. Yes, it is. It's appositioned because this cortex doesn't align at all with this cortex, and it's more than the entire entirety of the bone, so it's more than hundred. It's a hundred percent dislocated or translated uh, to the lateral um, part. And is it rotated? It's hard to see here. I'm not an expert in that. Um, not quite sure, but clinically, uh, we we should check clinically. And what is the angulation here? Well, we take a line through here, and we take a line through here, and then we'll kind of measure. And usually, there's a measurement tool in the X-ray, um, but I would say let's just just from eyeballing it, maybe maybe 45 degrees here. Okay, so then we can describe this for our orthopedic consoles and say whether we should operate or not. And usually, as we'll come to, proximal humerus fractures are usually never operated on. Okay. Um, I just skipped a, a good link for cases um, that I also posted in the beginning. Um, but go back a few seconds and, and just pause and, and go to that link if you want to check or if you want to test your skills in using these, um, these mnemonics that I just showed you. Okay, um, so just some take homes here from EM cases on this is like the lateral view is also the, also the orthopedic view. Spend most time on that one. Uh, use the same approach each time. Use systematics. Okay, um, then you'll become better and better at it, and know when there's differences. Uh, when you've seen a lot of normal, then you know when there's no abnormal. X-ray doesn't substitute for exam. Use the base principle for that, and 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 gather a good pretest probability. Um, um, central X-ray, central ray is really important. X-ray in the middle of the X-ray, that should be the one, the thing that is most important. Don't don't uh, 
try to skip X-rays just because you 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 want to spare them. Uh, uh, if they really if you really think they have a fracture, especially in like the forearm where there might be a circular or vanillikrans fracture, then you should X-ray the parts that you need to. Um, always look at your own X-ray. I don't really believe this 20% that Aaron Sayal has said. Um, because I, I couldn't find the studies for it, but I'm sure he, he he's a he's a brilliant uh, physician, so probably there is a reference somewhere, but I just haven't been able to find it. But the take home is look at your own uh, look at your own um, uh, X-rays and do a good um, to 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 compensate for what the radiologists can radiologists can examine then always do a good referral like good pretest probability referral for the radiologist and most commonly missed fractures are the second one so what we call satisfying we're satisfied with the just the fracture that we see that's a cognitive bias um, we should be systematic using our system too like if the a the first a in our a a a b c's um, approach to the X-ray. The first A is really important. This is our gestalt. What is what is really important here? And uh, what is obvious? Then you go for that, and then you use your system two in the rest of the X-ray. And just like reading an ECG, the more you do it, the better you become. And then after a while, your system two becomes your system one. Okay. <clears throat> then just a short uh, note about other things that you might come across on x-rays, benign and malignant tumors. So you have something called NOFs. NOFs are like popcorn-like structures, a bit like they're really bubbly and they're like 30 to 40% of especially children have these, have one of these. Um, and imagine if you, there's never been a study where you just x-ray a child every year um, um, all through their, uh, like all through their skeleton. But I'm sure that like, or I, I don't know of a study like that, but I'm sure that um, it might be that a lot of more than just 40% of children has this, has these. So they look like this, like bubbly. They look quite bad, but they're, they're not, <laughs> they, they're just bubbly. It looked like glioblastoma if it was in the, in the brain. <laughs> so, and the treatment is do nothing. It's normal. Okay, then you have echondromas. Echondromas are also benign. Um, they might cause a bit more trouble. They also look bubbly, and they usually sometimes are. They're, they're sometimes find in the phalanxes. So this is an echondroma, like this hypodense area, where you can, and and they might increase the risk of fractures. Um, yeah, do nothing. And then you have lipomas, of course. They're more, they're not as X-ray uh, opaque, but then you have osteochondromas. And these like these are, these 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 can look kind of problematic because these these like like small appendages on certain bones, and they do grow in certain areas also. So if they look typically and they are located in, t in a typical area, then usually do nothing, as I'm told. Um, but I would probably call someone for for this. <laughs> Okay, then you have these. This is what you call sunbursting. And you also have some cortical uh, widening here. Um, and it doesn't look that good. Um, it looks uh, heterogeneous as well. Heter uh, uh, as well. And here as well you have sunbursting and you have this perios that doesn't look good. And you have widening and yeah. These are osteosarcomas. Um, usually the patient will have pain during the day and worsening at night um, as, as, oppo as opposed to night um, pains for children. Usually you'll have your, your night pains only at night. You won't have them during the day. So if you have persistent pain during the day that worsens during the night for a longer period of time, then uh, especially if you have a palpable heart mass on the bone, then it's definitely something you need to do an X-ray of. And then you have the other kind of cancers in the bone metastases that we see with prostate cancer, lung cancer, breast cancer, especially and malignant melanoma that goes to the bones. But all other cancers can also grow in the bones, but these are really, really bone prolific. And then you have malignant tumors of the soft tissues, like I think it's lyomyosarcomas. Um, 
and m like muscle tumors and uh, yeah and these these are uh, if you're swollen in an area in, in an area that is not like a lipoma a lipoma is usually not appearance they're really soft and um, especially if there's a child over three years old then it's just and then, then you need to um, do a really quick assessment on that okay then we come to the treatments so just general rule of thumbs about treatments when treating anything in the emergency department in orthopedics we talked about if they have a high precess probability then we might do steric decision making if the x-ray is negative and we don't think there's any significant soft tissue injury or anything that wouldn't be able to be seen on an x-ray <clears throat> then we might do steric decision making on whether they should be immobilized or not um, depending on how high the risk or precess probability is for for missing anything bad like scaphoid fractures um the shared decision making is because it's not it's not totally benign just to immobilize patients for two or three weeks at a time uh, as we alluded to there could be frozen shoulders there can be sarcopenia there could be rehab long rehabilitation for it so, and compartment syndrome complications with casts so on and so forth uh, lost work so it really is a shared decision making i, I believe this depending depending on the risk um okay so then you have something that the um, that that orange shell calls the fracture the person personality of the fracture and the patient and it's important the fracture is is it a good or a bad fracture like can this heal on this own we will we'll, we'll, we'll go into how you assess whether it's a good or a bad fracture according to our shell and then uh, whether the patient is a like what the patient's personality and that, that that's this is what the orthopedic surgeons always want to know about like ADL, like activities of daily daily living uh, are they sports uh, sports active are they elite athletes athletes what are their requirements in their daily lives um, um what are their preferences to live far away so on and so forth so um do they are they a smoker or do they have diabetes um like will there be healing complications so on and so forth so these are some like general rule of thumb, like things that we have to consider each time we treat a patient with a fracture or with any kind of injury. And of course, every any any time any kind of injury, you need to like also think of analgesia and Movicol and antiemetics um, and splinting and then reducing it. If it's a bad fracture, then you'll do it um, in an open way. Sorry, if it's a <laughs> um, if it's a bad fracture, then you'll do an operation, which is an open reduction. And if it's a bad fracture, then you'll do a closed fracture. Uh, if it's a good fracture, sorry, you'll do a closed reduction. Then you'll usually immobilize if it's a fracture, and then you'll do some kind of rehab. You need They always need rehab, and they need to move, and they need to know wh how to move and how to live. That, that was the information part that is really important, but often neglected um, by anyone in the emergency department especially in orthopedic surgery because but it's really really important it should stand it should, it's a there should be a high uh, highly uh, like a neon sign in all of the um cookbooks out there where it says uh, under each fracture like when it says like just splint um and conservative management then there should be a quite detailed information uh, about how what what are we going to say to the patient about the duration and the how to live with this and what to expect and so on and so forth okay okay so um when it comes to reductions the english word reduction can both be for a fracture but also for a dislocation um for um for reductions that are dislocations then it's what is important is it's time and relaxation and and steady pressure uh, instead of just yanking it um and we'll we'll we'll, we'll talk about this uh, in a little while um it's important there, there's this rule of thumb that any joint must be in like any dislocation or subluxation subluxation must be in joint before the patient leaves the department so meaning that you have to reduce everything in the emergency department if not there is a specific plan for operation right away um if there's a dislocation and a fracture usually you want to just call ortho at least and then ask if 
they should reduce it or you should do it. Um, it might be just an avulsion fracture of an of a anterior shoulder dislocation, and then usually we can just fix it. But otherwise, sometimes it might be something harder. And always do an X-ray before um, your um, your reductions, uh, unless it's it, unless uh, it's been an atraumatic uh, atraumatic dislocation, uh, like a, of a shoulder where they've done it several times before. And there is no uh, neurovascular injury. Okay, so fractures can be good or bad, um, according to Arun Sayal. And this is where he says, like, there are some pearls in all of the classifications. And he's like, he's, he's tried to, as I understand it, he's tried to, like, boil it down to these four that are important in, each fract in, in all fractures. So is it commuted in the fracture? Is it intraarticular? Is it shifted, like dislocated? And is it oblique? If it is um, any of these things, then it's, there's a high risk of this being a bad fracture. It will not necessarily heal on its own. Um, and there, there, like there are certainly dislocated fractures that will heal on their own uh, clavicles, for instance, to a good function. It just takes some time. Um, but the others, comminuted fractures, intraarticular inter and oblique fractures, usually they will shift when you when you're if you put weight on them, and that's why usually they have to be operated on. Um, and um, so th that's a bad fracture. But others, fra and that's where you want to consult uh, orthopedic surgery. But other fractures, you usually they are quote unquote good, um, and you can reduce them closely, clo closed. And and he talks about this this thing called obtain and maintain. Um, every time you see a fracture. And obtain is like, uh, is it currently in an acceptable position? Like, should we do anything about, about it now? It's it's a, it's a question. <laughs> and that's all about well, does it look bad right now? Um, for instance, you might have a humerus fracture that is ob that is oblique. That looks good now if it's not uh, dislocated, uh, it's in line. But will it keep, like the maintain part of that question is, will it keep being like that? Um, or will it shift? And that's all about like, what are the acceptable angles um, for this fracture? Could we, how likely is, is it to shift? And if it shifts, what then? So that's, these, are, these are questions that we need to ask ourselves when we have fractures. Um, if you want to like have more details uh, about his obtain and maintain, then check EM cases or, or Vimeo or, or the other links that I posted on him. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, about treatment, I talk about immobilization. There's a magical like two to three weeks. That's where you will develop a lot of complications after that, especially in shoulders, fingers, and elbows. So um, really instruct, instruct patients in for shoulder Cotman exercises pretty uh, early on and make sure that their pain is managed as well so that they can move and they, they, are, that they get a plan, especially if they ha don't have any follow-up. Um, then they should really uh, have a good, decent plan from the emergency department about mobilization and rehabilitation. And mobilize as soon as you can. If it's if it's not going to shift, then mobilize as soon as you can. Okay, so let's talk about reductions. And reductions is defined by reduction is a surgical procedure to repair a fracture or dislocation to the correct alignment. So it's misaligned, it's not enjoined, it's or soft like soft like or uh, or luxated or dislocated. Or there's a fracture which is not aligned, um, is dislocated, um, and um, then you have to reduce it to make it look uh, put into the correct anatomical position. And then it could be enclosed reductions or uh, open reductions. And open reductions is surgery, like this. Here they're just shifting them, but <laughs> yeah, but. Um, and he, or close reduction, here's the Cunningham technique with Neil Cunningham uh, for anterior shoulder um, uh, dislocations. And then there's luxation or dislocations. It's bone and not in joint. 
there's this is what you call complete disengagement that's a complete luxation or dislocation but then you also have subluxation that's when the articulating surface remain in contact somewhat but there's an increased distance or it's not totally like not the entire thing is is, is articulating that's an incomplete luxation both of them has to be reduced okay why should we reduce and one of my my best friends and colleagues Emilia uh, Jolson usually asks like why why ask the good question like if this patient is going to be operated on anyway why should we reduce it like cause some pain and as I understand I'm, I'm not I'm not hundred percent sure about this answer all the way but as I as I believe I understand it is that. <laughs> The longer a joint is reduced, is is in a anatomical disadvantaged position, um, it's dislocated or fractured in a bad way. The longer it is not in the right position, the higher the risk for swelling, for nerve neurovascular injuries, for pain. Um, um, it, it just it, it goes up for compartment syndrome, and. Um, if none of the bad stuff happens, if there's no neurovascular injuries, if there's no any other problems with this fracture, but then only the swelling, if it has to be operated on later on, then it's like the more swelling, the, the harder it will be to operate on, as, our, as I understand it. Like, sw like you want, you want muscles and bones like to be as as good as possible when you want to operate on them, and and, and by reducing, then you will make the best um, then you'll make, make, make the area look as good as possible and and, and, and it will be as complication free as you can get it uh, for that particular situation. So that's part of that, that, that as I understand that's why we have to reduce it promptly but um, and then Arun Sale usually talks about the cartilage spurring um, like um, if it's done gently, then like if if it, then then it won't won't rub off all the cartilage, <laughs> um, and I guess it's a lot of them is like it's better healing uh, as well. It, of course, if if they're not going to be operated on, then it's obvious that we should um, put it into uh, correct anatomical position most of the time anyway. Um, um, if it's a dislocation, but if it's a fracture, then then sometimes, I mean, then there are acceptable angles, and if it's minimally um, angled, usually it's all right, right? And 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 then that's what we use our cookbook for. So so it's it's I guess it's it's a truth with some um, some um, grains of salt as well. This, but and I uh, but but I think the operation thing is 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 a good like. Way of thinking of this, and at least it reduces pain for patients and so on. So, so, so these are the reasons that are usually given. Okay, so, so for this location and fractures, like this is Ken Milne's. Uh, Ken Milne used to be an orthopedic surgery um, resident as well, so he, he he usually he likes orthopedic surgery, and he he comes up with this great rule. I think is like this location. Um, how how to fix that? is all about it's not about yanking it's not about power it's about relaxation time and then constant steady pressure so the relaxation part is first of all what you always have to do is communicate uh, in the cunningham method you are sitting uh, right in front of the patient so you, you have to communicate with them um, and that might be enough for most of the patients in the anterior shoulder dislocation, for instance. But communication is really, really powerful tool. As I, you don't have to, I, you know that I like this. <laughs> so communication is a really powerful tool um, for for reducing and not just not just word communication, but also your your nonverbal way of communicating. Like, are you calm? Are you holding the patient's arm when you're examining so they can relax? Are you going about it in a professional manner, so on, so on and so forth? These are like the compassion, the care part. Are you, are you, at, are you, giving them pain meds before doing anything if they need it, and so, so on? Like compassion and care, right? Um, also, the environments. Like, are they in a busy emergency department, or are, could could you can you use a room where there's no noise? Um, really important. Then next step can be 
doesn't need to be. A lot of as our, a lot of reductions can be done without pain meds um, <clears throat> uh, for uh, at least anterior shoulders. But so then you can use local anesthetics like a hematoma block, a finkel block, a, 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 a um, or, or just um, interarticular block as well, or interarticular uh, lidocaine. Next step would be light sedation. Um, where, where you can do like the more Scandinavian traditional diazepam and 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 um, morphine. So you use like five or ten diazepam and you wait for uh, a couple of like ten minutes to twenty minutes and you give them the morphine and then you then then um, the half life of that is 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 a bit. Uh, or then you need to know the half lives of this and and. Um, it, you might want to do PSA sometimes instead. Uh, Ruben Sturry at least believes that the re this light sedation with midazolam and morphine is higher risk than doing a PSA with ketamine. Um, but uh, yeah, just see, knowing what you have in your toolbox. Then the time is like take your time. Muscle needs to relax usually when you're doing a dislocation reduction at least. So take your time. Don't hurry, and that's hard in the emergency department. But you need to in, you need to go into that mindset, and then it's important with it's like it's all about having a tactic, knowing what you're doing, what where you press press, and not like yanking stuff and not doing it really really forceful and um, but just like a continuous pressure. Always do neurological status before and after. And should you do an X-ray before? Well, usually, if it's all, the general rule is almost always do an X-ray before. There are certain times where you don't maybe need it. Um, some of them are angle, like neurovascularly compromising angle dislocations that you should not do a one before. You should do it now. Um, there is the um, um, the, the shoulder where you where, where the patient has done this a hundred times before and it's not traumatic this time either and don't, they don't have any neurovascular problems then they shouldn't do it either there probably um, but in general just like do it if you if you if you need to um, most of the time they, they will probably say you should okay so Let's let's go through a a, a, a um, distal radius reduction here. So, this is a patient who has fushed, fallen on outstretched, hand, outstretched hands, and gotten a distal uh, radius fracture with a um, dorsally angulated um, segment, which we would call a um, no a distal radius fracture. That it might be called a collis fracture, but it's uh, getting out of fashion. Um, this is a dorsal side, this is a volar side, and then we need to consider, should this be operated on or reduced? And I don't want to now, right now, go into like all the details of this radius fracture and about when to operate or not. This is just like an example of reduction. So we need, we think obtain, maintain. Does it look all right right now? Well, no, we should probably try to put it back. This looks like a young bone. It's probably a young patient. We should we should reduce this. Okay, so obtain. Um, do I need to reduce this? And we'll heal probably just like this. And this is where like Arun Sayal usually says like if we don't know, like sometimes it's we don't know. Um, is this angular angulation acceptable, and so on? We should look it up. Okay. If this is a 95-year-old elderly home patient in it with a distal radius fracture who doesn't have any activities of daily living left, then according to the Swedish guidelines, then yes, <laughs> then this is this is acceptable. But depends. Um, and if we don't know the angulations and so on in the cookbook, it doesn't say so in the cookbook. And then we need to find out. Then. Okay, can it be maintained? And that's the thing about what is this a good or a bad fracture? And this is it commuted? No. Is interarticular? Mm, no. And here's the here's the joint. It's not interarticular, it seems. Uh, is it shifted? Yes, it's shifted dorsally. Maybe by fifty percent, twenty-five, fifty percent. And it's also angulated. 
uh, is it oblique? No. So, so, so these four questions about a good bat, it's, it's, it's a good fracture. It's a bit shifted, but we can fix that. And then the personality of the patient, the functional level, and can they be followed up, the preference, and so on. And these, we don't know about this patient, but let's say it's a well-functioning patient and, and they can. Okay, well, then, and this is this this um, mnemonic is from I'll, I'm going to use here is from this lecture, so you can check that out. So the fragment is shifted dorsal, dorsally. Then, as a general rule, then we should push it down the opposite way. We should press it volally. Where does it want to go? When it's when it's like when we have reduced it, when where does it want to go? It wants to go up again. And that's why we should mold the cast in a bit of flexion. And on the on our course and in Scandinavia, maybe we don't do that that much. For for like for radial fractures, um, we don't always think of the molding as like, like we're doing it at an angle. But uh, there's limited evidence, as I understand it, to this, and it's a matter of preference. But uh, this is how Arun Sayal usually talks about it. <clears throat> Meaning that with a Smith fracture, if it was volally, then we should push it up. It would want to go down again, and we should therefore um, um, mold it in uh, extend in dorsally dorsally uh, flexion, not in volar flexion. So um, but that's how that's how he 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 thinks about it and use it. Um, please use the local protocol that you are used to, and your your cast. Um, your, your cast uh, nurses are usually excellent at this. Okay, then we then it comes to the reduction part. Then we think about relax, time, and pressure. Okay, so make the patient relaxed, and then we have to use time here uh, and then pressure. So here's the lecture in on from EEM where he goes through his tramp um, reduction mnemonic. So tramp T for traction. Usually you'll use some kind of device where you have the fingers in a, in, in small uh, Chinese traps and then you pull the patients for 10 minutes or 20 minutes um, um, for these distal radius fractures and then you um, then you, then they'll become traction. This will disimpact the bone. Like the the bone is like like the periost is usually sticky and and you and, and the muscles and all the material here. So you have to disimpact it before you can actually pull on it or or, or um, push it and this goes for all fractures like you have to put traction if it's an ankle fracture then you have to like flex the leg and put traction on it um, as long as uh, along with traction usually you have to reduce the muscles uh, so what you cannot see in this picture is that you have to um, bend, bend at the elbow so that the other muscles are not activated. Um, you're also bending the knee when you're doing an ankle reduction so that the muscles are not activated. So you're reducing the muscle strain on the, on the area. It's all about relaxing the muscles here um, and then disimpacting. And then you, the R is reducing it. And when you reduce it, then you first of all, you will actually um, increase the deformity to kind of disimpact it even more. And you do that with angles as well, and, and with this as well. So you go up first. Um, so if you if you're track, traction putting traction on 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 the limb here, and you're you, you're you're kind of standing here, uh, or, or the patient is in a device here, then you will move. So you're standing over here with your face at this uh, in, facing this direction. Um, um, and, and then you will use your um, one hand to keep the traction here and the other hand to push here with your thumb. And then, then you will uh, like pull the hand up first. That will be increasing the deformity. And then you will afterwards with your thumb push down, like push in almost a, like a, a bow, kind of an arc. So you don't just push, push down, you can like push a little bit up and then down. And this you'll do while, while, like while you're holding a hand up, and then you'll pull down. So up and down. And then there's a huge debate on whether you should hold it after you've reduced it or not. And 
some orthopedic surgeon says like well there if it's going to if it's going to shift then it's going to shift you cannot do anything about it you don't have to hold it while you go doing the cast and others say you have to it, well it, for us it takes a long time to hold it and i mean it, it, it's a matter of personal preference it seems okay and then then you but then, then you apply your splint materials and we'll go into that in a little while how to do that and then you'll do then you'll mold it um and uh, Rusayal would say that you have to mold it in the opposite direction of where it wants to go um molding it is like the cast has to be um <clears throat> flattened and, and 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 put in position that's what you do with flat hands and our ensayal usually use this kind of mnemonic that straight cast makes a crooked bone, crooked cast makes a straight bone. Straight cast would be um, a, a cast that you don't like, you don't mold with angulation. Um, and a crooked cast would be an angulated cast, but that would create a straight bone. It's uh, it's it's a matter of speak. Uh, it's and it's Arun Sayal saying this. Uh, at our course, there was highly this was highly debated, and I don't think there was a tradition for molding it in flexion or extension that much, um, and because there's not much evidence in that area. But again, uh, it's a matter of personal preference. And then the position, how far uh, up the arm and how far down the thumb has to go is really important. This part the position part because the patient has to live with this for a long time and it's really really important to make it so that you don't immobilize the, the, the any joints that don't need to be immobilized so make sure like painfully make sure that the thumb is free okay so for splinting this you can you can check out these are the links for these um these um posters uh, different kind of splintings for different areas of the body. You can check that out if you want. And then the general splinting principle is that usually you put on a stockinette first, then you uh, apply some repril, which is like a, a cotton kind of, like really soft kind of tissue. And you usually go 50-50 so that you pull one around and then you then 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 you you overlap 50% with the next one and you just roll around until you get where you want to and you have to apply this quite tight if you apply it too tight it'll just break so apply it as tight as you can and it has an inbuilt um, too tight mechanism and then you put on the wet, wet plaster depends on what kind of plaster you want there are different kinds we'll go through it and then you put on after the plaster, plaster is, 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 is put on and you'll put on the elastic bandages and then you'll uh, mold it and then you're done with the with the um, splinting seems easy but there's a lot of art going into this and the the, the splinting nurses are f phenomenal at this um making it look easy okay and yeah um Again, the, the scaphoid, scaphoid um, fractures might be actually, there's a recent RCT I'm told that tells us that um, you might as well just put them in a um, radial cast, which is less than a normal scaphoid cast. Depends on how well your nurses are, are doing this. Um, but yeah, something to think about. Okay. So you have different plaster materials. You have your um, synthetic uh, plaster materials. Um, you have, and then you have your your the one that will come here, which is um, um, the the chalk. <clears throat> so there are different features for these. So if you just take the synthet synthetics ones first, then um, the, the 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 glass fiber one you cannot mold this one you uh, this one you can mold and the, and the chalk one you can mold a lot um, the good thing about the synthetic ones are that they're quite light and they're good to use for elderly and 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 um, and children um, and the chalk was a bit heavier um, the synthetic ones will dry in a very short time maybe five to five minutes for uh, just drying and 20 minutes for being able to work on them 
and the chalk will take hours for them to be able to walk on it usually so yeah water resistance is um a problem with the chalk they're not water resistant you cannot bathe with them usually I have to have a plastic bag over it or something like that these are somewhat you should not like, like get you should not bathe with them these either but they can get out in the rain okay um and then how many layers well this is uh, i actually don't know this <laughs> so um and i've never used this so but the polyester is four layers and and the pl uh, chalk is eight layers of plaster for a decent um cast and then the brittleness of this well like will really break if you walk on it this yeah glass fiber is not for walking on it this will not break you can walk on it and this is somewhat brittle so depends these are like the features so in general you probably use the synth like it's all sometimes you don't have any other things in your departments but um the polyester i'm told is good for the elderly and children because of the low weight and it's drying, drying quite uh, fast um um, the chalk is the more like if you have to mold it it's really important to use chalk um, and it's also a matter of like what have the nurses been uh, trained in and this is also more expensive and it's a bit um, more toxic to your uh, fingers i think um, like you can get uh, allergic reactions on it and so on but yeah okay so before you do the plaster you you have to think about how long should it stay on like how important are these small diesels if it's an angle reduction right now and you uh you have to plaster it and then 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 it's just a matter of hours before it goes to operation well then you don't have to be that particular about all the deep nuances um, but if it's something that has to stay on for a long time then you have to be much more particular then you have your gloves um, on always because there might be a risk of dermatitis if you use um, different plaster materials, especially especially, especially polyester, I think. Um, then you do the neurovascular status before and after the plaster of the patient, and then you gather your materials and um, um, one more person, and then you reduce uh, the joint, and then you anesthetize and you do your tramp. Okay. The complications for plaster um, are usually like immobilization of joints that shouldn't be immobilized. Here, like as an example, the radial casts, you always have to make sure the thumb is free, is really, really important, uh, and that they can scratch the neck so that they, it does, the cast doesn't move. Um, and you have to do the neurovascular status. It's, uh, the cast, when it sets, it can pressure on, on the body. It's, of course, it's, a mo it's an immobilization. It's kind of the part, the, the reason why we're doing the cast. But the, there's a risk, like like, like if it's, if the cast the, the, if it's a cast that they can walk on, then they should walk on it. If they don't, then they'll just have a hard time when they um, get the cast off, right? A longer re rehabilitation. Um, and then you have your uh, compartment uh, syndrome. It's really important to check for um, the the compartment syndrome, especially with circ circumferential casts. Just think of burn wounds and some circ circumferential burn wounds. It's really important to check for these. Okay. <clears throat> um, let's go through this again. So you apply your stocking net. You make it a bit longer than you think usually because you know you can always. Um, you can always cut it off uh, afterwards, and it's important. To, like when you're done with this part, this part, and this part, you need, and you want to, like, um, then you want to pull down the stockinette so that you have a soft uh, edge of the cast because the cast becomes quite hard. So you want a, a soft edge. So pull the stockinette a bit longer than you think. Okay, then, and this is not shown in the picture, but you you have to bolster certain areas of um, uh, bone that are really uh, uh, close to the um, close to the surface such as the styloid process here or the um, radial process and so on um, the fibula is another place the proximal fibula is another place where you want to uh, and the malleolus are also a, a different place but you want to do that as little as possible because um, this is an area where there's no 
the uh, direct contact to the server to, to the to the bones so it, it's is uh, are the the ones that we talk to the the casters we talked to said that it's it's important to pollster but do it as little as possible okay then you <clears throat> apply this cotton like web rule we talked about 50 50 overlap and and then you just make a hole for for the thumb here and then apply it as hard as po possible because it will just break if it, you pull it too hard then apply the plaster and what you do is like you if i have to plaster this area then i will measure it with my plaster my with my plaster and then i'll go one two three four five six seven eight if it's a chalk cast and one two three four if it's not a chalk cast um, there are there's sometimes you don't have to do uh, four times, but uh, as a general rule of thumb. Then you put it into water when when you know how much you need to, you need, and you you will use um, the colder the water is, the, the slower the process is, and yeah, it it can maximally be be 25 degrees hot. With the chalk, you put it into water until there are no bubble left, bubbles left. With the synthetic, you just dip it, and then it'll be all right. Squeeze excess water out, and then um, you, you can use colder water if you want it to set slower. These are the nuances. Um, and then apply as wished. Um, and and don't, um, don't hold with the, your finger on the plaster. Uh, not on the uh, like important spots <laughs> because then you'll pressure it in um, and then you apply elastic bands afterwards and again there's a 50 50 overlap and then you mold with flat hands not with your fingers but with your flat hands again you don't want the cast to have fingerprints uh, and be uneven Okay, so this is a uh, <clears throat> quite bad, um, majorly displaced um, angle. Um, maybe fracture, but at least a um, um, at least a um, dislocation that we don't know yet. Uh, we don't know yet, but um, we don't want to reduce. We don't want an X-ray before we reduce uh, in this uh, specific case because we need to. Uh, make things happen here because of the um, tenting here and the possible neurovascular injury. So before, okay, we see this injury. What do we do? Well, before we we want to check whether this is an open you open wound or not, and whether or not they need antibiotics. And then, and if they if it's, if there's an open you an op open wound, then we'll uh, do a macroscopic cleaning of it. No. Um, no spooling, no, not a lot of water, just macroscopically cleaning the, the worst of it. Um, we'll, we'll come back to why later. Then we'll use analgesics, uh, um, maybe intraarticular, 20 milliliters intraarticular lidocaine. If that doesn't work, then we can use a PSA, like 100 milligrams of ketamine. <laughs> oh, it depends. Um, but ketamine is a good choice here. And it's used pre-hospitally usually for these uh, uh, these kind of cases in in Stockholm at least. Um, then always check the neurovasculature before and after, right? And if there is a problem before, then probably the solution will be to reduce it, right? So um, th just because there's no pulse right now, that just means well we have to act now. It doesn't mean that oh we should do an angiogram or something. We 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 reduce and then we see. Okay. Uh, delay the X-ray. Don't do anything. Uh, like we we have to do the X-ray afterwards, and then because we, this is a time critical thing. And then assemble the plaster and do like the materials and everything you need. And then you can apply some of the materials uh, uh, when we're ready. You can apply the materials right away, um, so that you can. So you don't have to have pull over all the things when you once you have reduced it. That's just a tip. Okay, then you have then you do the reduction. Flex the knee to remove the muscle activity. Let someone um, hold the, the patient's knee and keep the, that traction. Like hold the thigh of the patient and so that the knee is flexed in a 
um, 90 degree angle and then you can like pull like that. For all of these reductions that we're going to talk about, please uh, check out Larry Malik's videos. They do them real, life, real time. Uh, Larry Malik on YouTube. They're really great. Um, and they might have nuances on how to do it. Again, this is not an exact science. This is something that is highly traditional and locally bound, but uh, this is one way of doing it. And this is something that emergency physicians should be able to do when it, once it comes in through the door. Okay, then you put your hands on the heels and um, and uh, in front of the foot, like one hand here and one hand here. And then you uh, do, as like we said before with the collarless fracture, um, you increase the deformity. Well, you, you already put traction on it. Then you, then, you, then, you, then you increase the deformity pulling that way first. And then maybe pulling that way and then in here. And then, then you then usually it'll, it'll go in. So you pull that way, pull to length, and then push uh, laterally. Um, in this case, and then then you apply the cast, and you usually do do a for this you do a U like this down to the down below the angle, but that's where the plaster will be, and then you'll do a back slap like. Uh, from from maybe here and up uh, up here. Okay, and you'll check the neurovascular status. And while you're while while everything all the plaster is being uh, applied, then you'll just hold the patient's uh, big toe or the fourth toe. We were told because if it's the fourth toe, then you'll keep is it's, it's probably easier to hold it um, like that. And then you won't your fingers won't get in the way of the plaster. And then you do the X-ray and the ortho contact, and you do the compartment and neurovascular observations, and so on and so forth. All right, these are high risk of compartment syndrome and open fractures, so make sure that you examine them properly, and maybe delta, like time as a test, examine them sequentially. Okay, let's let's. Go into more of details about how to apply the cast, uh, the, the cast materials here. Um, this is these are pictures from uh, my friends, and I've I've, I've been um, I've been allowed to uh, to use these pictures. Um, <laughs> um, this is from the course that we did. Okay, so uh, this is the leg of my uh, my good friend Emilia and. Uh, she's going to have a cast of. Let's imagine that her ankle was um, um, very um, badly injured and 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 it's dislocated as we just saw. And then we put the stockinette on. We put the pole string on here on the medial malleolus and also the lateral and also on the fibula probably. Then you put the vepro on. Look, uh, see the 50/50 um, overlap, and it's been pulled tight. And then you slap the, the uh, you you have measured out how how far it goes up, and you you measured um, uh, this is polyester, so it's four layers. You you dipped it into water, and then you apply it here, and then you um, have someone to uh, hold it. And there is no one holding it, uh, this right now, but but was it a real patient? They would hold the toe here, and then you just mold it with your hands, like this. Uh, flat hands, and then you put the back slap on as well here, and in between here they put on the elastic bandage because on the of the first cast, and then they put on the second cast afterwards. Again, then they put the elastic bands on, and then you hold it until it sets, and then you push up the like this is the extra stockinette, and this is the. Um, 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 this is the yeah sorry this is the extra stock in the vepril and like this makes a really good smooth et etch and my uh, friend uh, Nelia here has has done a great job on on um, on the cast I think okay another case here is. Um, a, again, radial fracture. You have a, your stockinette uh, applied, and 
uh, sorry, distal radial fracture, and you apply your stocking up onto uh, over the um, the elbow. And you put on stock. Uh, you put on um, pole string, and you put on the vepril. And the vepril is um, applied in the 50-50 manner, and you make a small hole for the thumb, and then you make the patient hold this. Here, we uh, you're molding it uh, so that it's in uh, like Arun uh, Arun Sayal would say, like it's in dorsiflexion because the f the fracture is is going up up here. You 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 want to push it down, and it wants to go up again. And actually, they're molding it in the wrong way, right? So they should mold it downwards, so that the, so that you're kind of pushing the pushing against the way that the fragment wants to go. But anyway, tradition is tradition. Then they put on gloves because they don't want to get eczema from from the polyester. So you and then you apply the poly the polyester cast, and the, you can do it like this in a crisscross manner. Um, all the way down here, you can see like sacking here. That then it's going, then it's good, um, up to just be, uh, just below the knuckles here. And then when you come up here, then you go all the way down here again, and then you um, cut the edges so it doesn't hurt, and, and then you um, nuance this by pulling out the stocking net and then making like a small uh, incision here. So you can pull that down like that, and uh, you pull the the above elbow part of the stocking down here again, and then you can apply the um, the elastic band. And here again, you're being really meticulous about the thumb area. That's why they they're doing this. They're cutting this when you get to the thumb area. They're cutting this. Um, so that this part, this really, really small part can go in here and then they can just move around instead of having a big chunk of, of, of elastic band in, in the thumb area. And then they mold it. And and uh, then they, again, the thumb, they want to be sure that the thumb is totally free. Okay, so here are the, some common reductions that the emergency physicians to know about. The collar's fracture we already went through. Um, we um, the anterior shoulder uh, we'll go through in a little while here. Um, and then you have your nurse mate uh, uh, fracture uh, uh, dislocations uh, where you used to do it in one way, but uh, there's a new technique. I'll just quickly show you. So just to recap, the collar's fracture, the distal radius fracture. First of all. You bend it up, yeah, you apply traction, and then you go up, and then you um, pull it down. And here they want you to go, do a little bit of, just a little bit of um, um, ulnar deviation here. And, and, and that might be um, good. Uh, uh, that's what we were taught in the course to do. So. Here's the uh, nursemaid, um, and we used to do it in one way, but I'll just show the, the new way, which is better, um, it seems like, from studies, and it's less painful. So um, you will keep one hand here on the radial head, so you know, you know that it's going in. You'll hear pop, and you'll just hyperpronate the arm. No, no, like earlier, well, I think it was a supination, and you'll pull in, like flex in the elbow, and this is easier. It seems and um, much more tolerable for the for the for the, for the children. Larry Melik has a video on this, so check that out. Okay, then shoulder dislocations. Um, there's a great talk that I'm basing a lot of this off um, on on YouTube by Neil Cunningham, the founder of the Cunningham technique, and and he there's also a homepage he's made I think um, called dislocations.com.au. Um, Neil Cunningham, I think, is a physician from Liverpool um, who's currently working in Australia, and he made this great Cunningham technique that I'll go into um, uh, in a little while. So shoulder dislocations, there are different kinds. There is the anterior, um, which is the most common, and these can be dealt into subclenoid and subcoronoid. 
Um, and you have something called a really rare condition called luxation erecta, where the patient is like doing a salute kind of. Um, it, seems, it seems like he's doing a salute. The, the arm is up, not down. Um, and then you have the posterior where they cannot externally rotate the arm. Um, okay. Important stuff about the serial dislocation and the reduction. There's not a single method that works all the time. In the best of hands, um, one method works maybe 70 to 90% of the time. That's why we need to know several methods uh, as emergency physicians and as orthopedic surgeons as well. There are certain movements that are really important uh, for most of the um, reductions. So that is that the scapula is moved medially either by making the patient shrugging their shoulders and making a proud chest and in addition to this adducting the arm. Um, these movements go again in a lot of these tests so these are important to start off with. Um, then it's important to know that usually what may, keeps the patients from actually reducing um, for the anterior at least um, is because of spasm in the biceps and the subscapularis muscles. So a lot of the, um, it's really important for relaxation part of, of reductions that we take this seriously and we try to reduce, relax the patient and maybe massage these areas or um, that's what they do in the Cunningham method anyway. So, but, but the biceps and subscapularis are usually the reason why, um, um, the shoulder is not reducing by itself. Um, and that's important knowledge. Then, and then, then there's a usually used to, we used to use traction and some methods still use traction, but Cunningham would say that you should never use traction and, and at least, at least not a lot of traction, like in the Hippocrates method or, or the Eskimo method where you like have a foot in the axilla and then pull or yank on the arm because any any yank will at some point reduce the arm but but there is an unacceptable risk of an axillary nerve injury when you do it so in general you should as a rule of thumb you should not you should never track use traction on the arm and then you know, Collingham would say 90% of patients don't need drugs, and that's in an expert hands, right? So, but just to say, like, they don't necessarily need drugs. You can do an intra-articular lidocaine, or you can just relax them um, if you need, especially if you're using the Cunningham method. Be slow and deliberate, um, and well, if nothing works, then you have to sedate them, and sometimes you do have to do that. Um, but yeah. Here are the different kind of anterior um, uh, dislocations. The subcoronoid is the most no, the normal one. Then you have the subclenoid, and the, then the really rare ones, subclavicular and intrathoracic ones. Um, Neil Cunningham has has this um, this algorithm. Whether our uh, whether for which method he's going to use, and the, mo the most important is like. Can the patient adduct? Um, and if they can adduct, then he will use his Cunningham method in general, or the Cochrane method, um, which I'll, I'll go into. But if they can't adduct, then you have to use the zero position method. I think that's maybe the, my take home from, from these. Um, if you have done an x-ray so that you know whether it's, what, what, what kind it is, then, then he goes into details of what kind he wants to use. If it is a subglenoid, which is usually the reason why they can't adduct, then, 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 you'll, um, then you'll use the zero point method. Um, and I'll show you why. Um, because like in short, th this is like the subcoronoid, as I, as I understand, this is a muscle spasm problem where you just have to like relax them in some way to make them and, and make some adjustments. In this, it's like caught also in a way that you cannot just pull in the same way as you would in the Cunningham method. So you have to do what you call a zero position method and it's where you pull all the way up here and, 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 and then they will um, um, reduce. Okay, Cunningham also has one in the field here. You can read that for yourself and pause the screen. Okay, so the, the methods. I already went through the traction method. Don't do that. Uh, like the Hippocrates method or the yeah uh, these methods where you have to pull on the arm hard. 
Then there's the Cockroth, Cockroth method. Um, the original is without traction, and that's important according to Cunningham. So um, you can check out the link here. But can they, they have to be able to adduct. And then you tell them to have the chest out and the shoulders back, like shrug. And that was the part of where you have to have the scapula medially. And then you adduct the arm. So you place the elbow all the way into the side. Um, it's like pressing against the side. And then you, then you from this position, you will... Um, oh, sorry, this was the traction method. Don't do that. But here you adduct the patient's uh, arm all the way in here to the side. And then you will externally rotate the patient. And like, bear in mind that she's shrugging her shoulders and putting her chest out. Uh, that's really important for the medial rotation of the scapula. And you externally rotate slowly, 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 and and they will say stop. Until, and, and you'll be surprised, according to Cunningham, when they are actually stopping, um, because they, they, you'll go quite far. So when the patient says stop or you feel resistance, uh, that's far enough. And then you will, from here, you will lift the arm. So you will flex in the um, shoulder joint um, as far as possible. And then maybe you'll do, and then you'll do, do a, a slow turn inwards, uh, internal rotation, going from out here to in here to in here, and then usually you'll reduce. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's a, that's a cockroach method. It's really, it's um, the, the only real contraindication to it is like if it's a greater tuberosis injury, it will not work. It only works for these subcoronoid dislocations, so they have to be able to adduct. Then you have your Stimson's method, and the Stimson's method is actually the one we usually use in our department, um, and because and, and we were told to, on the course to use as the first method because it's the most um, it's the it's the it's the most <laughs> time efficient. Uh, you don't have to be at the patient's side uh, all the time. And the patient can just lie on their... So this is where the patient lies on their stomach. Uh, their arm are not allowed to hit the ground, so you have to have a, a, um, a bed that is high enough. And then you uh, attach some weights, usually five, around five, weight, five kilos, not to their hand, but just to their wrist. And we usually have some these circumferential weights that you can pull, like, like put on. And, um, then you, and then you pull the scapula medially, until the, until the patient to, to shrug their shoulders and relax. The patient maybe talk with them in a bit, and then you go walk out of the room um, 10 or 20 minutes, and then you, oftentimes it's just pulled back. Nine out of 10 times it will be good. And this is probably one of the safest methods. It should probably be used as a first um, method uh, for most things, uh, if not the Cocker and the Cunningham unless it's a special case where they cannot adduct. I'm not quite sure whether they have to adduct here or not, um, um, but probably they, they might have to adduct. You know, I'm, I'm not quite sure here. And, and, and uh, I couldn't find any um, literature about that. Um, then the Cunningham method. And if you have not heard about this, please like look, look at the videos. They're amazing. <laughs> and it does look like magic, but it really isn't. It's all about like reducing muscle spasm. The muscle spasm here in the Stimson method, it's, it might be that this is actually tiring out the subscapularis muscle, and where this Cunningham method, method is uh, massaging the biceps um, tendons. So what you do is that you put the patient in the analgesic position, which is facing, the, sitting the patient, uh, like face the pa sitting patients, and then shoulders back shrugging and chest up again this is a common theme and then then you hold the patient's arm and i'll show you how and you pull downwards and i think we'll just go to the next page to, to see this um method okay here was the first the stimson method where you have something hard um, pull not not in the patient's uh, fingers but in the in the wrist sides of the wrist and then you'll immediately like pull this uh, the 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 the, um, the scapula immediately okay here's the cunningham's method 
So again, sitting in the analgesic position, and you'll have this, the hold, as Cunningham says, it's, it's not a traction, it's steady downward hold, not pull or traction. Um, and the patient is uh, usually with your with your with with their hand on your shoulder. Then you will do adduction. So the uh, the the again the same thing as as before, where you where you have the patient's shoulder like the arm all the way into the sides. And then instead of doing the the entire cocker uh, cocker method here, you'll just um, reduce the biceps spasm by bending the elbow. This is what you're already doing here. And then um, gently massage the mid humeral biceps and then massage the trapezius and the deltoids and continue until the patient feels better. You will not hear a pop, but you'll just glide in and suddenly they'll just look at you. This is especially good for the patients who has had um, solar dislocations done a lot of times. If that part doesn't work you, you might do a slight anterior posterior flexion like going forward and backwards just a little bit in the shoulder joint so going a bit up here and uh, like up and down so to find a perfect angle yes all right so this is the zero um the zero um degrees method and this is where you you um, have the patient lying on the back, and some some versions of this say so you have to tra use traction, but but uh, Cunningham and others rule against this. Maybe just gentle traction, but not a lot. And then you'll slowly and gently abduct, abduct, like abduct the shoulder. And as you're abducting the shoulder, you'll go like this up and down and up and down in oscillating movements, anterior, posteriorly. And then when you come to the 90 degrees point, then you will externally rotate um, at 90 degrees, like turn. And uh, then you will continue up and down and up and down and up and down. And once you come to 120 degrees, then usually the, the, the it's it's been um, reduced and then you'll um, pull the arm in um, on the stomach and again it's about pulling all of these things out here that's the um, idea and here's a picture of my um, <laughs> of my um, lateral stroller and it's a good idea sometimes if you don't know where you are and then, then paint on the patients it's it's a good idea to actually get the feel of the anatomy so here's the clavicle and the ac joint here's the acromion uh, here's the um, the uh, spine of the scapular uh, you can just see here this v configuration where the, um, the clavicle and the scapular is forming this v the trapezius here and what you have here is the processus coracronoideus and why I'm painting this picture is here you have a soft spot. If you feel on your own shoulder, um, you can you can feel like this is hard, 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 and then this is hard, hard, hard. But then there's a soft spot right here, and this is where you actually use. This is where you you're going to inject intraarticular lidocaine. So and and but where where are you going to aim? Well, you're going to aim towards this point. So you're going to aim that direction, and then inject. Um, there are certain, uh, yeah, so, so, yeah, so, so this is what, what you, you're going to do. Um, there are nuances to this and you can do it upwards and, or downwards. And I'm no expert at this, but this is how we were taught it. Um, and here you have, let's, let's go, do, let's go through some more reductions here. So finger reductions. Dorsal reductions are okay. Volar reductions are dangerous um, as they make up of maybe 10 or 20% only. So volar, uh, volar dislocations always contact orthopedics uh, for follow-up. Um, then you have your angle and you have your jaw. Okay, so pulling on this makes a Chinese vacuum trap kind of effect. It'll just give problems. 
um, it, you, you, you can reduce them in that way, but uh, it's, it's not as effective as this other technique that I'll show you. We have already done the ankle and the jaw. Well, we used to do like like this, maybe not in the, with this technique, but usually it's like you stand behind the patient, you um, put gauze into their mouth like that, uh, and then you uh, usually stand behind the patient, and then you'll pull down, and then um, not not jerking, like 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 steady motion, like relaxed time and pressure, and then then pull down and at some point usually you can pull them forward and then it goes in but there's a there was a study um that showed that if you just put a syringe into their mouth then that will actually reduce um reduce uh, the problem in 97 percent of the time and it's much much better uh much much less much less prob problematic for the patient and um, you can also use, there's another technique I've seen uh, seen being used as the tongue depressor um, uh, technique where you make the patient put into their mouth as many tongue depressors as they can fit. And then, and, and then every, I don't know, 30 seconds to 60 seconds, then they'll try to squeeze one more in and then squeeze one more in and then... Uh, then, then just give them a lot of tongue depressors and say this is your task. Then, uh, and then oftentimes they will. I'm, I'm told that they will just stand at the. Um, I think it's Ken Milne saying this that oftentimes they will just stand at the 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 entrance area and, like with a lot of tongue depressors and 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 they reduce jar and say it's like what what should I do with this? <laughs> so they they they've they've uh, they reduce it themselves and it's a good thing. Um, so, yeah, and besides neurovascular uh, status, you should always check the stability of the joint afterwards. And um, because if it's not stable, then it'll just soft locks or locks again. Okay. Then dorsal, the, the dorsal finger dislocation. Okay, so um, so the jo the joints of the fingers, as Arun Sayal uh, puts it in, the, in this uh, lecture is like this. So, and what has happened when you dislocate it is it will look like this. So when you do traction in each area here, especially if it's been going on for a while, then it's, there's a lot of swelling, it's really hard to reduce it. Then then pulling like this will just make it look like it, will make an effect like a Chinese finger trap. So what you, um, it'll just get the forces <laughs> to go against you. So what you have to do instead, according to Arun Sayal and according to the course that we attended, is that you should push here. Because if you push here, of course, like use all of the other tricks that, we, that I've talked about so far, you have to reduce a bit, like extend the, extend the deformity before uh, a bit before. So what you're doing is you're pulling up here, and then you're gently pulling, like pu pushing here, so pulling, uh, pushing up there, and pushing here. This is the main area, and then then you just glide, glide this joint in there. Look at the video here; um, it, it looks really good. <laughs> okay, for patella joints, um, or for patella dislocations, these are usually children. Um, but can be adults. It's almost always laterally um, dislocated. And there's a ligament going he from here to here that is usually snapped, uh, or sorry, sorry, sorry medially, uh, that is uh, going medially here, that is usually broken. Um, and there are some details on where that, that ligament can be broken in children. It literally breaks um, here and in adults is down here and there might be some fractures involved with it. But um, let's, if you have a patient coming in with this, first of all, you have to reduce it. So you will relax the quadriceps. So massage and straighten the leg. Okay. And then there are different ways. You, you can just push this way Arun Sayal would say that all oh, the the the, um, the control surfaces might might um, might be damaged uh, if you push like that. So he he suggests that you push down on the lateral side of the 
um, the patella, and then then it'll just then it'll raise the other lateral side, the medial side, um, and then then it'll just like like a boat like um, scoop in. Um, but the the course directors we talked about talked to didn't uh, say that, that that mattered too much. Um, the, the the important thing is to straighten out the leg before you do it. Um, if that doesn't work, then you can do it with a passive uh, leg raise and repeat it. It's really important to get an X-ray afterwards, um, especially in children, because um, if there's swelling afterwards and and you do an arthrocentesis and there's blood, uh, especially if there's blood and fat pearls, then there's a fracture. Um, or like maybe an imminent, imminent uh, there, there might be a fracture, or there might be some kind of um, cartilage breakoff, which is hugely important in children, especially. So you, you need you need the MRI within a few days to actually fix this. So that that's important to to keep in mind. Keep in mind, femur fractures usually that's um, big trauma, and I won't go into too many details here. But in general, you have to use traction to put it into place. There's lots of these devices and each device is different in, in, in all the places I've ever worked. Look it up at your own place. Um, we usually use what you call a hair traction device, but there are lots of different smart and not smart devices. So use the one that you have at your place and get comfortable with it. Um, yeah. Then you have your olecranon luxation. And as we'll talk about in the part two um, of this lecture, then um, these luxations are usually uh, sometimes goes with uh, cor um, processes coronoid uh, fractures, and then they will be unstable, and then they have to be operated on. And it's really subtle. So um, if they have a lot of asymmetry in, on post-reduction films, if they have a lot of swelling before, if they have um, um, if if, <laughs> if they have a lot of um, there, there's a, a few rules that m makes you want to think about doing a CT scan on this for for checking for coronary fractures or at least checking really really closely for coronary fractures. But let's talk about the re the olecranon reduction. These patients are in a lot of pain. Um, the anterior shoulder are also usually in a lot of panic and a lot of pain, but they, they, they can usually be relaxed by just uh, by talking with them and in, in, and in, and and intraarticular um, injection. But these patients usually cannot be fixed just by that. So you still need to usually do an intraarticular injection uh, of lidocaine, maybe 10 milliliters or 20. But you also need to um, do a um, what you call a um, you need to you need to give some some drugs intravenous drugs morphine um, and uh, like um, diazepam something like that uh, to make them relaxed. There are different techniques here. Uh, most important is you have to have the arm in supination. That's really important. And you the the technique we were taught is like stand behind the patient. And have someone pull traction on on their arm, and then um, you gently push with your thumbs here, and you need to do early follow up with them when you, when they reduce. There's another method that I've um, seen uh, on some of Larry Millick's videos uh, that looks pretty cool, where you put your forearm along parallel with the with the patients and then you like um, then you hold their fingers and then you like do a flexion with your arm here and their arm here and then usually it'll, it might pop in i've never done either of these myself so okay then talking about nerve blocks check out especially nysoras uh, for examples of needed nerve blocks and check out these links as well if you want to check out more about this um, going into nerve blocks, we always have to talk about the last syndrome, local anesthetics um, syn syndrome toxicity. And here are some of the homepages, especially this lipid rescue is really 
a nice homepage for uh, all things lipid uh, emulsion. <laughs> um, but in general, the last syndrome is this kind of spooky man that we always think about but almost never see. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why someone can be numb in certain areas when they're when you're doing these they might hyperventilate and so on but um but if you're if you if, if the patient has been injected with lidocaine or some kind of um lidocaine uh, like substance and and they're beginning to go along this 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 um this stairway to cardiac arrest um with the symptoms for last syndrome then then you should really fast um um, convert them with lipid uh, emulsion um, therapy. Um, usually it's like quite vague symptoms in the beginning, but then it can be convulsions and coma. So if they feel numbness in tongue and, and they have some visual disturbances, and then stop immediately. Okay. The treatment you have here, and the treatment is um, like symptomatic in general, but it's um, it's uh, lipid emulsion, a bolus of 20% intralipid, 1.5 milliliters per kilo IV, and then an infusion afterwards. That's the um, usual treatment for this. And call anesthesiologists at right away because they might have to be intubated as well. Okay, so here are the doses, the max doses for, for, for this. And here, this is from the narcosguidance.se, and this is from Rebel EM's um, um, uh, blog on this. And keep in mind different doses for different um, solutions, and different um, drugs. One thing we were talking, uh, I, I talked to a, an, a, um, specialist in, in 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 this area and he you and again this is anecdotal so <laughs> but um, he said that actually the doses are might not be as important as the area that you're doing it in so if you're doing it in a very highly vascularized area um, like a bleeding hematoma um, then you should be much more worried about it than, than if you're doing it in a um, tranquilize like if you're tranquilizing as a, a small wound um, or a large wound um, so it, it depends on the vascularization whether there is a higher or lower risk for this as well there's at least a component he said in this um, so let's go through just a few examples so we kind of have some figures in our head for this so we usually use, use a silicone um, Four milligrams per kilo is the max dose. Silocaine, so a 70 kilo person, for, um, that would be um, 280 milligrams, 2%. That is an old way of saying 20 milligrams per milliliter. So that would be 14 milliliters for a 2% solution. And for 1%, it would be 28 milliliters. So if you have a large wound, that, I mean, you are usually close to that effect. Um, uh, so, so, so if you have a really, really large wound, then you have to consider doing some kind of other tranquilization. Maybe do a nerve block, or doing some kind of other um, infiltration, or doing it on, in, in in operation in on, on a general anesthesia. Or at least doing it during uh, under monitoring. Okay, another thing we often use is this uh, ropivacaine, uh, ropivacaine, which is what we use for the um, femoral hip block. And here um, there is not enough, not that much margin of error. We usually inject around um, uh, that amount for for our patients. Um, so it's so there's not so it's important to 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 realize that um, we don't we cannot do a lot of these we cannot do a lot of these things twice like doing local anesthetics 
uh, not for a while at least, um, because the duration here is four to six hours. We have one shot usually once we inject stuff. Okay, hematoma blocks. So this is something that we will use, especially for uh, distal radius fractures, but you can use it, use it for different things as well. Um, um, so tranquilize the skin above. Um, not all people do that, it depends, but I will usually do it. Uh, wait until there's an effect, then advance the needle. Um, usually you do it from behind, not from, um, not from here but from here into the um, area you know that you hit the area once you don't hit bone and once you get a flashback um, so you'll do a small aspiration as you move along and then once you get blood flashback then you know that you're in the right place unless it's pulsating blood then you're in the vessel but usually you'll be, you'll not be on the side you'll be in the middle and um, then you will inject if you hit bone, then you will just reduce the angle or, or increase the angle and then try again. And then you'll put in maybe 15 to 20 milliliters of 1% lidocaine. Again, 70, 70 kilo person is li around 28 milliliters, that is max. And it's a highly vascularized area, so we might not be as careful as we should with these things. But there's a tradition that last syndrome doesn't happen uh, as well. so. Um, it's probably quite safe the way we do it. Okay, then finger blockades. Um, this is from a hand surgeon uh, that um, his method. Um, there are different methods of doing this where you can only stick once if you do it me on, on the volar side. Um, but I usually do it like this. So you ride in the wedge where one finger begins and the other ends. Um, right at the bone uh, level or you, know, you, you feel the, you, you kind of feel the bone here uh, when you go down and then you inject half a milliliter of lidocaine and then you go further down and you inject uh, half a milliliter usually i do it the other way around though i i go <laughs> go down first and then i inject and i pull back so i don't have to stick my way through uh, once i put a um, put in lidocaine so I'll just go through first and then up and then out and then once more up and out okay and then you have a finger blockade and then remember usually when you cut in the finger then you have to have some kind of sedation or morphine or something afterwards because it hurts afterwards it's a very tender area so But if you haven't made any cuts, then it's all right. Then you don't have to. Femoral nerve block. I'll sh use this video um, to check that out. Uh, it's really um, the way that we do it as well. Then you have your ear uh, blocks and then check out these videos. I won't go into these. with these. Okay, suturing. Um, suturing is another of these areas where we've done it for ages and ages and we <laughs> I was never taught the evidence of this and I don't think a lot of people actually know the evidence and I think the best effort I've seen for, for picking, like collecting the evidence on this is the laceration repair series by uh, First 10 EM and um, yeah he um, Justin Morgenstern check that out it's, it's, um, it's a, a work in progress but um, there are some great uh, lectures there already and one of them is the um, lecture on, uh, sorry, the, the evidence on whether suturing technique or um, uh, what you call suturing technique, to, uh, whether suturing or stereostrips or gluing is the best. And the bottom line probably is that we, we, we may religiously think that sutures are much better in most areas than we, we should. I mean, especially for children, um, but in general, we should probably use glue a lot more because the cosmetics and the, um, like the results in always in part, like in, 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 in infection and in all, like it doesn't matter. It seems the, 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 um, the, the good thing about sutures is that they have a 
better tensile strength. So if it's over a joint or if it's a complex wound um, with a lot of tension on it, then probably sutures will be a, the be, like uh, the best. So for straight wounds, for um, and for non-complex wounds, then glue are usually the best. Sterist, uh, glue or stereo strips. Stereo strips can sometimes, if they get bloody, then they get then they're not as sticky. So, I mean, if it's a very bloody wound, and then then I usually do that as well with with sutures. But this is a matter of preference. But it's just to say that, especially in children or people who are really afraid of needles, or you you can use the other things with and and the cosmetic. Um, co cosmetics will be just as good or just as bad, <laughs> at least similar. Um, but please check out First Ten EM on Justin Morgenstern's um, Lesser Recent series here for these things. Another thing I just wanted to say about this series is that he he checked the evidence for um, for um, infections with 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 um, late rep late reparation. Uh, late closure of wounds and I mean as, as long as it's not grossly contaminated y there's no reason why you probably shouldn't um, close a wound if it's been open for a long time then maybe and if they're diabetic then maybe give them antibiotics but in general he, he uses like a shared decision making with them like well um the cosmetics will be better if the if the wounds uh, are if the wound is like if the if the um, uh, edges are um, close by each other and leaving a wound open will not achieve this usually so they, it will heal but it will just scar a bit more or a lot more uh, sometimes so he will just ask the patient well do you accept that just maybe a potential like theoretical uh, larger risk of infection. There's no evidence to back that up, um, as you can see in his blocks. Not a lot, not a lot anyway, and probably the opposite. <laughs> um, but he he asks the patients anyway like that, and um, usually the patient just goes along with it. And I think that's a good idea. I would do the same. I will. I I would want my wounds closed, as long as it's not special wounds like. Uh, bite uh, some bite wounds um, in the hand, um, or or um, but but even even that kind of evidence is, is 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 really lacking as well. So please check out his blocks on 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 this. is really um, <laughs> mind boggling why we haven't done more studies on this thing that we have done so much. Uh, we were doing every day. Um, the last one is like sterile gloves versus not on these um, patients well you should there, there's no difference in using normal gloves from a sterile packaging or the quote-unquote totally sterile gloves so that you, you can use the ones that you normally use you don't need to use sterile gloves on this like suturing okay and the infection part is it doesn't make sense physiologically why 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 is it that you 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 wouldn't close a wound it's not like you like we think we're closing the uh, the bacteria inside of the it, it's it, it's making so opening the wound will make the bacteria escape doesn't it make the bacteria come in during the course of the time where the wound is open it, it doesn't really like you might have a you might May, you might be able to make a case, but it doesn't really hold like that mechanical logic. It doesn't really make sense. And I think we really need evidence on that area. And the evidence says, well, we should close the wound, even though it's gone beyond the the time that they usually say. Okay. So just a few basic techniques about wound um, uh, wound suture and technique. And the reason why I'm going through this is like I I was never I was taught this, but it's a long time ago. And once you like go away from it, and then then you might might pick up back bad habits and so on and so forth. And there's a lot of religion here as well, because a lot of this is these cert like the surgeons area, and a lot of tradition, a lot of tr a lot of um, a lot of um, pimping goes on in the operating theater. So I'll just show I'll just show you like 
the techniques uh, I was taught and, and, and they, like how I, I, I checked it with some of my surgical colleagues and it's all right um, for the most part anyway. So holding your tweezer or your, your, your needle holder, um, you'll hold it, with, you, you'll put your thumb and your fourth finger in here and then you can uh, stabilize with your uh, third finger and your index finger, you'll put, put that here. Um, that's how you hold that. Um, when you uh, when you're um, then clamping down on on this, then you'll you'll, you'll you'll clamp down on this with a 90 degree angle, and then you'll pull the package away, not the needle out of the package, but the package away. And then you make sure that you don't you don't touch the um, the border area here. You'll maybe go down maybe one third to um, one fourth of the area of the entire needle and that's the way you hold <coughs> usually at a 90, 90 degrees angle again depending on the wound depending on what you're suturing depending on the like again this is religion a lot of it but and then you will the way you will hold your um, um, tweezers is like this that you will stabilize the entire thing with your uh, third finger and your the um, the area had the pocket here so that you can actually you don't have to hold it with your with your tweezer grip with your index finger and your with your thumb you can just this is stabilizing it so you can just this is how I was taught it anyway okay um, then what is what we are doing when we're suturing is that we are trying to approximate the skin um, uh, edges. If the patient has really thin skin or or like prednisone treated, then sometimes it's not it's impossible to, to, to suture it, and you just have to do a band aid or plaster it, um, but or steri strips it or whatever. But and if it's bleeding a lot, then then sometimes you have to do a special suture, doing a, a, a figure of eight suture or 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 something like that. And if it's really deep, then sometimes you have to like suture in the fascia. But usually at that point, I will usually usually ask some uh, surgeon of some kind to assess it. And so, but one of the things that you should never do is to pull too tight because that that would be um, a problem for like making it ischemic. So always think like we just have to apprehend, the, like we just have to approximate the, 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 the <laughs> just make it as close as, as we can, but not, but not too tight. That's the main goal. So a way you can do this, once you've done your loop, you can just pull both, both ends, both ends of the strings over here. And then you can like, when you, when you're tightening it, have a small gap. Um, and then you can always check afterwards to see if you can get your um, needle holder uh, in between and then it's tight enough. Okay. So your basic suture technique is the, is the most important one, your, your simple sutures. Um, and I won't go into detail with this, but uh, important is to go into a 90 degree angle. If it's a difficult wound, especially go out in between and then go in again so that you get the angle right. So it's 90 degrees. This is, this, I mean, this is a lot of pimping again. This is uh, usually not, this is without, this is without evidence, um, but it's, it's common, it might be common sense, might not. Um, do I check for 90 degrees all the time? No, I don't. But again, as long as the edges are approximated and it looks all right, um, then it's good enough for me and it's not too tight. Okay, <coughs> I'll just show you some different um, suture techniques that um, beyond the like the basic one that might be needed in in different cases. So this is a horizontal mattress. Um, so with a horizontal mattress, you will go in here, and then like traditionally you would go in here. And here, and then here, and then you'll pull. And and but 
I was taught this different um, method uh, recently where, you, where it's a modified horizontal mat mattress. Where if you have a wound like this where it's a lot of tension and this might be ischemic and so on, or high risk of ischemic injury, then, then, then you can go in through the dermis instead, instead of through the skin. And I'll show you here, I think, here, yeah. Go here, go in here, and then through the dermis, not through the skin, and then again through here, and then up here, and then you'll just close like that. The other one is the um, vertical mattress. If there, again, if there's a lot of tension on wounds, then you can you can do this. I'll maybe do one or two of these, and then I'll do simple sutures afterwards when, once the tension is relieved. If it's really a if it's a bleeding wound, then you have to like do a couple of really fast um, sutures, uh, and then you might cut them up afterwards. It doesn't have to be pretty in the, at first. You just have to stop the bleeding, right? And then you can always do the cosmetic ones afterwards. Um, this one is usually best seen from here. So you'll start here. This is where here you'll start here and go down here. And then the modified, usually the, the, the traditional version is you go up through the skin and then down here and then up. But the modified version is like this, that you go down. And then I, I've gone out, out through here. So, so I can show you that I'll go in here again. This is here. And then instead of going out through the skin, I will go out here instead. So I'll just make that bow. And then I'll go in. It's, it'll just, it'll, I mean, this requires you to pull quite a lot on the skin to, to make that bow, but it's less holes in the patient. <coughs> Again, do what you know um, in the situation. These these I use when there's like difficult wounds or wounds that have at least tra traction on it. And when the traction is gone, I'll just suture and usually I'll, I'll try to do a method where you suture halves. So if I've done a suture here first, then I'll t take the half of that and then I'll take the half of that. Um, yeah. Okay, for tetanus, I mean, this is the Danish uh, recommendation. Just have use the one that you use, but just remember it. So this is from the State and Serum Institute, the SSI. And um, yeah, you just have to remember the one local uh, to you. Um, so this is the end of part one. Um, <laughs> and uh, then we'll go on to part two, where we will... Well, where I'll um, go through much more specific um, uh, conditions and going area by area into uh, what kind of fractures exist and what what area what what fractures we should not miss when we see a patient who might have had an injury in the angle area or the knee area and so on and so forth. So, looking forward to um, seeing you back then. All right, take care.